Ulysses 15, F, the sixth of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, F. Bloom. Pigeon-breasted, bottle-shouldered, padded, in nondescript juvenile grey and black striped suit, too small for him white tennis shoes, bordered stockings with turnover tops, and a red school cap with badge. I was in my teens, a growing boy, a little then sufficed, a jolting car, the mingling odours of the ladies' cloakroom and lavatory, the throng penned tight on the royal stairs, for they love crushes, instinct of the herd and the dark sex-smelling theatre unbridles vice, even a price list of their hosiery. And then the heat. There were sunspots that summer, end of school, and tipsy cake. Halcyon days. Halcyon days. High school boys in blue and white football jerseys and shorts. Master Donald Turnbull, Master Abram Chatterton, Master Owen Goldberg, Master Jack Meredith, Master Percy Apjohn, stand in a clearing of the trees and shout to Master Leopold Bloom. The Halcyon Days. Mackerel! They cheer. Bloom. Hobbledy hoy, warm gloved, mamma muffle red, starred with spent snowballs, struggles to rise. Again, I feel sixteen. What a luck! Let's ring all the bells in Montague Street. He cheers feebly. Hooray for the high school. The echo. Fall. The use. Rustling. She is right, our sister. Whisper. Whispered kisses are heard in all the wood. Faces of hammer dryads peep out from the bowls and among the leaves and break, blossoming into bloom. Who profaned our silent shade? The nymph. Coyly through parting fingers. The ewes. Sweeping downward. Sister, yes. And on our virgin sword. The waterfall. Pula fuka, pula fuka, 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 fuka. The nymph. With wide fingers. Oh, infamy. Bloom. I was precocious. Youth. The fauna, I sacrificed to the god of the forest, the flowers that bloom in the spring. It was pairing time. Capillary attraction is a natural phenomenon. Lottie Clark, flaxen haired, I saw at her night toilette through ill closed curtains with poor papa's opera glasses. The wanton ate grass wildly. She rolled downhill at Rialto Bridge to tempt me with her flow of animal spirits. She climbed their crooked tree, and I, a saint, couldn't resist it. The demon possessed me. Besides, who saw? Staggering Bob, a white-poled calf, thrusts a ruminating head with humid nostrils through the foliage. Staggering Bob. Large teardrops rolling from his prominent eyes, snivels. Me, me see. Bloom. Simply satisfying a need. I With pathos. No girl would when I went girling. Too ugly. They wouldn't play. High on Ben House, through rhododendrons, a nanny goat passes. Plum puddered, butty tailed, dropping currants. The nanny goat bleats. Me g g g g nanny. Bloom. Hatless, 
flushed, covered with burrs of thistledown and gorse pine. Regularly engaged, circumstances alter cases. He gazes intently downwards on the water. Thirty-two head over heels per second. Press nightmare. Giddy Elijah. Fall from cliff. Sad end of government printer's clerk. Through silver silent summer air, the dummy of bloom, rolled in a mummy, rolls rotatingly from the lion's head cliff into the purple waiting waters. The dummy mummy. Far out in the bay between Bailey and Kish lights, the Erin King sails, sending a broadening plume of coal smoke from her funnel towards the land. Councillor Nenetti. Alone on deck, in dark alpaca, yellow kite faced, his hand in his waistcoat opening, declaims, When my country takes her place among the nations of the earth, then, and not till then, let my epitaph be written. I have bloom. Done. Proof. The nymph. Loftily. We immortals, as you saw today, have not such a place, and no hair there either. We are stone cold and pure. We eat electric light. She arches her body in lascivious crispation, placing her forefinger in her mouth. Spoke to me, heard from behind. How then could you? Bloom. Pawing the heather abjectly. Oh, I've been a perfect pig. Enemas, too, I've administered. One third of a pint of quassia, to which add a tablespoon of rock salt. Up the fundament, with Hamilton Long's syringe, the lady's friend. The nymph. In my presence, the powder puff. She blushes and makes a knee. And the rest? Bloom. Dejected. Yes, Peccavi. I've paid homage on that living altar where the back changes name. With sudden fervour. For why should the dainty scented jewelled hand, the hand that rules? Figures wind serpenting in slow woodland pattern around the tree stems. Cooing. The voice of Kitty. In the thicket. Show us one of them cushions. The voice of Flory. Here. A grouse wings clumsily through the underwood. The voice of Lynch. In the thicket. Phew! Piping hot! The voice of Zoe. From the thicket. Came from a hot place. The voice of Virag. A bird chief, blue-streaked and feathered in war panoply with his assegai, striding through a crackling cane brake over beech mast and acorns. Hot, hot! Where sitting bull? Bloom. It overpowers me. The warm impress of her warm form. Even to sit where a woman has sat, especially with devaricated thighs, as though to grant the last favours, most especially with previously well uplifted white sateen coat pans, so womanly, full. It fills me full. The waterfall. Fill a full a pull a fuck a pull a fuck a pull a fuck a. The use. Sister, speak. The nymph. Eyeless in nun's white habit, coif and huge winged wimple, softly. With remote eyes. Tranquilla convent, Sister Agatha, Mount Carmel, the apparitions of Knock and Lord. No more desire. She reclines her head, sighing. Only 
the ethereal, where dreamy, creamy gold waves o'er the waters dull. Bloom half rises. His back trouser button snaps. The button. Yep. Two sluts of the comb dance rainily by, shawled, yelling flatly. The sluts. Leopard lost the pin of his drawers. He didn't know what to do. To keep it up, to keep it up. La 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 la. Bloom. Coldly. You've broken the spell. The last straw. If there were only ethereal, where would you all be, postulants and novices, shy but willing like an ass pissing? The ewes. Their silver foil of leaves precipitating, their skinny arms aging and swaying. Deciduously. The nymph. Her features hardening, gropes in the folds of her habit. Sacrilege! To attempt... My virtue! A large moist stain appears on her robe. Sully, my innocence! You are not fit to touch the garment of a pure woman. She clutches again in her robe. Wait, Satan, you'll sing no more love songs. Amen, amen, amen! Amen. She draws a poniard, and, clad in the sheath mail of an elected knight of nine, strikes at his loins. Necum. Bloom. Starts up, seizes her hand. Hoy, Nebracada, cat o' nine lives. Fair play, madam. No pruning knife. The fox and grapes, is it? What do you lack with your barbed wire? Crucifix not thick enough? He clutches her veil. A holy abbot you want, or Brophy, the lame gardener, or the spoutless statue of the water carrier, or good mother Alphonsus, eh, Renard? The nymph. With a cry flees from him unveiled, her plaster cast cracking, a cloud of stench escaping from the cracks. Polly! Bloom. Calls after her. As if you didn't get it on the double yourselves. No jerks and multiple mucosities all over you. I tried it. Your strength, our weakness. What's our stud fee? What will you pay on the nail? You fee-men dancers on the Riviera, I read. The fleeing nymph raises a keen. Eh? I've sixteen years of black slave labour behind me. And would a jury give me five shillings alimony tomorrow, eh? Fool someone else, not me. He sniffs. <sniffs> Rut. Onions, stale, sulphur, grease. The figure of Bella Cohen stands before him. Bella. You'll know me the next time. <laughs> Bloom. Composed, regards her. Passe. Mutton dressed as lamb, long in the tooth, and superfluous hair. A raw onion the last thing at night would benefit your complexion, and take some double chin drill. Your eyes are as vapid as the glass eyes of your stuffed fox. They have the dimensions of your other features, that's all. I'm not a triple screw propeller. Bella. Contemptuously. You're not game, in fact. Her sow-cunt barks. Right. Blue. Contemptuously. Clean your nailless middle finger first. Your bully's cold spunk is dripping from your coxcomb. Take a handful of hay and wipe yourself. Bella. I know you, canvasser, dead cod. Bloom. I saw him, kid keeper. Pox and gleep fender. Bella. Turns to the piano. Which of you was playing the dead march from Saul? Zoe. Me. Mind your cornflowers. She darts to the piano and bangs chords on it with crossed arms. The cats ramble through the slag. She glances back. Huh? Who's making love to my sweeties? 
she darts back to the table. What's yours is mine, and what's mine is my own. Kitty, disconcerted, coats her teeth with the silver paper. Bloom approaches Zoe. Bloom. Gently. Give me back that potato, will you? Zoe. Forfeits. A fine thing, and a super fine thing. Bloom. It is nothing, but still a relic of poor mamma. Zoe. Give a thing and take it back. God will ask you, where is that? You say you don't know. God has sent you down below. Bloom. There's a memory attached to it. I should like to have it. Stephen. To have or not to have, that is the question. Zoe. Here. She holds up a reef on her slip, revealing her bare thigh, and unrolls the potato from the top of her stocking. Those that hides knows where to find. Bella. Frowns. Here. This isn't a musical peep show. And don't just smash that piano. Who's paying here? She goes to the pianola. Stephen fumbles in his pocket and, taking out a banknote by its corner, hands it to her. Stephen. With exaggerated politeness. This silken purse I made out of the sow's ear of the public. Madam, excuse me, if you allow me. He indicates vaguely Lynch and Bloom. We are all in the same sweepstake, Kinch and Lynch. Dans ce bordel où tenons notre état. Lynch. Calls from the hearth. Daedalus, give her your blessing for me. Stephen. Hands Bella a coin. Gold. She has it. Bella. Looks at the money, then at Stephen, then at Zoe, Flory, and Kitty. Do you want three girls? It's ten shillings here. Stephen. Delightedly. A hundred thousand apologies. He fumbles again and takes out and hands her two crowns. Permit, bravi Manu, my sight is somewhat troubled. Bella goes to the table to count the money, while Stephen talks to himself in monosyllables. Zoe bends over the table. Kitty leans over Zoe's neck. Lynch gets up, writes his cap, and, clasping Kitty's waist, adds his head to the group. Flory. Strives heavily to rise. She limps over to the table. Bloom approaches. Bella, Zoe, Kitty, Lynch, Bloom. Chattering and squabbling. The gentleman. Ten shillings. Paying for the three. Long me a moment. This gentleman pays separate. Who's pinching it? Oh, my two pinching. Are you staying for the night? Or a short time? Who did? It's long after eleven. Stephen. At the pianola, making a gesture of abhorrence. No bottles? What? Eleven? A riddle. Zoe. Lifting up her petty gown and folding a half sovereign into the top of her stocking. Hard earned. On the flat of my back. Lynch. Lifting Kitty from the table. Come. Kitty. She clutches the two crowns. Flory. And me? Lynch. Hopla. He lifts her, carries her, and bumps her down on the sofa. Stephen. The fox crew, the cocks flew, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for her poor soul to get out of heaven. Bloom. Quietly lays a half-sovereign on the table between Bella and Flory. So, allow me. He takes up the pound note. Three times ten. We're square. Bella. Admiringly. You're such a sly boots, old cocky. I could kiss you. Zoe. Points. Yeah, deep as a draw well. <laughs> Lynch bends Kitty back over the sofa and kisses her. Bloom goes with a pound note to Stephen. Bloom. This is yours. Stephen. How is that? Les distraits or absent-minded beggar? He fumbles again in his pocket and draws out a handful of coins. An object falls. 
that fell. Bloom. Stooping, picks up and hands a box of matches. This. Stephen. Lucifer. Thanks. Bloom. Quietly. You'd better hand over that cash to me to take care of. Why pay more? Stephen. Hands him all his coins. Be just before you are generous. Bloom. I will, but is it wise? He counts. One, seven, eleven, and five. Six, eleven. I don't answer for what you may have lost. Stephen. Why striking eleven? Proper Oxyton. Moment before the next, Lessing says, Thirsty Fox. He laughs loudly. Burying his grandmother. <laughs> Probably he killed her. Bloom. That is one pound six and eleven. One pound seven, say. Stephen. Doesn't matter a rambling damn. Bloom. No, but... Stephen. Comes to the table. Cigarette, please. Lynch tosses a cigarette from the sofa to the table. And so Georgina Johnson is dead and married. A cigarette appears on the table. Stephen looks at it. Wonder. Parlour magic. Married, hmm? He strikes a match and proceeds to light the cigarette with enigmatic melancholy. Lynch. Watching him. You'd have a better chance of lighting it if you'd held the match nearer. Stephen. Brings the match near his eye. Link's eye. Must get glasses. Broke them yesterday. Sixteen years ago. Distance. The eye sees all flat. He draws the match away. It goes out. Brain thinks near, far. Ineluctable modality of the visible. He frowns mysteriously. Hmm. Sphinx. The beast that has two backs at midnight. Married. Zoe. It was a commercial traveller married her and took her away with him. Flory. Nods. Mr. Lamb from London. Stephen. Lamb of London who takest away the sins of our world. Lynch. Embracing Kitty on the sofa, chants deeply. The cigarette slips from Stephen's fingers. Bloom picks it up and throws it in the grate. Bloom. Don't smoke. You ought to eat. Cursed dog I met. To Zoe. You have nothing? Zoe. Is he hungry? Stephen. Extends his hand to her, smiling, and chants to the air of the blood oath in the dusk of the gods. Hangende Hunger, fragende Frau, möcht uns alle kaputt. Zoe. Tragically. Hamlet, I am thy father's chillet. She takes his hand. Hmm, blue eyes, beauty. I'll read your hand. She points to his forehead. No wit, no wrinkles. She counts. Two, three, Mars. That's courage. Stephen shakes his head. No, kid. Lynch. She'd lightning courage. A youth who could not shiver and shake. To Zoe. Who taught you palmistry? Zoe. Turns. Ask my ballocks that I haven't got. To Stephen. I see it in your face. The eye, like that. She frowns with lowered head. Lynch. Laughing, slaps Kitty behind twice. Like that, pandy bat. Twice loudly, a pandy bat cracks. The coffin of the pianola flies open. The bald little round jack-in-the-box head of Father Dolan springs up. Father Dolan. Any boy want flogging? Broke his glasses? Lazy eyed little schemer, see it in your eye. Mild, benign, rectorial, reproving, the head of Don John Comey rises from the pianola coffin. Don John Comey. Now, Father Dolan, now, I'm sure that Stephen is a very good little boy. Zoe. Examining Stephen's palm. Woman's hand. Stephen. Murmurs. Continue. Lie. Hold me. Caress. I never could read his handwriting except his criminal thumbprint on the haddock. Zoe. What day were you born? Stephen. Thursday. Today. 
Zoe. Thursday's child has far to go. She traces lines on his hand. Line of fate, influential friends. Flory. Pointing. Imagination. Zoe. Mount of the moon. You'll meet with a... She peers at his hands abruptly. I won't tell you what's not good for you. Or do you want to know? Bloom. Detaches her fingers and offers his palm. More harm than good. Here, read mine. Bella. Show. Sure. She turns up Bloom's hand. I thought so. Nobby knuckles for the woman. Zoe. Peering at Bloom's palm. Gridiron. Travels beyond the sea and marry money. Bloom. Wrong. Zoe. Quickly. Oh, I see. Short little finger. Henpecked husband. That wrong? Black Liz, a huge rooster hatching in a chalked circle, rises, stretches her wings, and clucks. Black Liz. She slides from her new-laid egg and waddles off. Bloom. Points to his hand. That wheel there is an accident. Fell and cut it twenty-two years ago. I was sixteen. Zoe. I see, says the blind man. Stephen. Moved to one great goal. I'm twenty-two. Sixteen years ago he was twenty-two too. Sixteen years ago I twenty-two tumbled. Twenty-two years ago he sixteen fell off his hobby horse. He winces. Hurt my hand somewhere. Must see a dentist. Money? Zoe whispers to Flory. They giggle. <laughs> <laughs> Bloom releases his hand and writes idly on the table in backhand, penciling slow curves. Flory. A hackney car, number 324, with a gallant buttocked mare driven by James Barton, Harmony Avenue, Donnybrook, trots past. Blazes Boylan and Linehan sprawl, swaying on the side seats. The Ormond Boots crouches behind on the axle. Sadly over the cross blind, Lydia Deuce and Minor Kennedy gaze. The Boots. Jogging, mocks them with thumb and wriggling worm fingers. Oh, have you the horn? Bronze by gold, they whisper. Zoe. To Flory. Whisper. They whisper again. Over the well of the car blazes Boylan leans, his boater straw set sideways, a red flower in his mouth. Linehan, in yachtsman's cap and white shoes, officiously detaches a long hair from Blazes Boylan's coat shoulder. Linehan. Ho! Oh, what here do I behold? Were you brushing the cobwebs off a few quibs? Boylan. Seated, smiles. Plucking a turkey. Linehan. Oh, good night's work. Boylan. Holding up four thick, blunt-ungulated fingers, winks. Blazes, Kate. Up to sample or your money back. He holds out a forefinger. Smell that. Lenahan. Smells gleefully. Ah, lobster and mayonnaise. <sighs> Zoe and Flory. Laugh together. <laughs> Boylan. Jumps surely from the car and calls loudly for all to hear. Hello, Bloom. Mrs. Bloom dressed yet? Bloom. In Flunky's prune plush coat and knee breeches, buff stockings and powdered wig. I'm afraid not, sir. The last articles. Boylan. Tosses him sixpence. Here, to buy yourself a gin and splash. He hangs his hat smartly on a peg of Bloom's antlered head. Show me in. I have... A little private business with your wife. You understand? Bloom. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Madame Tweedy is in her bath, sir. Marion. He ought to feel himself highly honored. She plops, splashing out of the water. Raoul, darling, come and dry me. I'm in my pelt. Only my new hat and a carriage sponge. Boylan. 
a merry twinkle in his eye. Tupping. Bella. What? What is it? Zoe whispers to her. Marion. Let him look. The Pishogue. Pimp. And scourge himself. I'll write to a powerful prostitute. Or Bartholomona, the bearded woman, to raise wheels out on him an inch thick. And make him bring me back a signed and stamped receipt. Boylan clasps himself. Here, I can't hold this little lot much longer. He strides off on stiff cavalry legs. Bella, laughing. <laughs> Boylan, to Bloom over his shoulder. You can apply your eye to the keyhole and play with yourself while I just go through her a few times. Bloom. Thank you, sir. I will, sir. May I bring two men chums to witness the deed and take a snapshot? He holds out an ointment jar. Vaseline, sir. Orange flour. Lukewarm water. Kitty. From the sofa. Tell us, Flory. Tell us. What? Flory whispers to her, whispering love words murmur, lip-lapping loudly, poppy smick plop slop. Mina Kennedy. Her eyes upturned. Oh, it must be the scent of geraniums and lovely peaches. Oh, he simply idolizes every bit of her, stuck together, covered with kisses. Lydia Dutz. Her mouth opening. Yum, yum. Oh, he's carrying her round the room, doing it. Riding a cock horse. You could hear them in Paris and New York. Like mouthfuls of strawberries and cream. Kitty. Laughing. <laughs> Boylan's voice. Sweetly, hoarsely, in the pit of his stomach. Ah, Gublais crack brucar crashed. Marion's voice. Hoarsely, sweetly, rising to her throat. Ah, wish wash, kissing a puhis na puhak. Oh, wish washed, kissing a puhis na Oh. Bloom. His eyes wildly dilated, clasps himself. Show high, show plow her, more, shoot. Bella, Zoe, Flory, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> Lynch. Points. The mirror up to nature. He laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Stephen and Bloom gaze in the mirror. The face of William Shakespeare, beardless, appears there, rigid in facial paralysis, crowned by the reflection of the reindeer-antlered hat-rack in the hall. Shakespeare. In dignified ventriloquy. Does the loud laugh bespeaks the vacant mind. To Bloom. Thou thoughtest as how thou wastest invisible. Gaze. He crows with a black capon's laugh. <laughs> Yargo go. How my odd fellow choke it his Thursday morning. Yeah, go, go, go. Bloom. Smiles yellowly at the three whores. When will I hear the joke? Zoe. Before you're twice married and once a widower. Bloom. Lapses are condoned. Even the great Napoleon when measurements were taken next to the skin after his death. Mrs. Dignam, widow woman, her snub nose and cheeks flushed with death talk, tears, and Toonie's tawny sherry, hurries by her in weeds, her bonnet awry, rouging and powdering her cheeks, lips and nose, a pen chivying her brood of signets. Beneath her skirt appear her late husband's everyday trousers and turned-up boots, large eights. She holds a Scottish widow's insurance policy and a large marquee umbrella under which her brood run with her, Patsy hopping on one shod foot, his collar loose, a hank of pork steaks dangling, Freddy whimpering, Susie with a crying cod's mouth, Alice struggling with a baby. She cuffs them on, her streamers flaunting aloft. Freddy. Ah, ma, you're dragging me along. Susie. Mama, the beef tea is fizzing over. Shakespeare, with paralytic rage, We'd a seeker who kill her fast. 
The face of Martin Cunningham, bearded, refeatures Shakespeare's beardless face. The Marquis umbrella sways drunkenly. The children run aside. Under the umbrella appears Mrs. Cunningham in merry widow hat and kimono gown. She glides sidling and bowing, twirling Japanesely. Mrs. Cunningham sings, And they call me the jewel of Asia. Martin Cunningham gazes on her impassive. Immense, most bloody awful demirap. Stephen. Et exalta buntur cornua uesti. Queens lay with prize bulls. Remember Pasiphae, for whose lust my grand old grossfather made the first confession box. Forget not Madame Gristle Stevens, nor the suine scions of the house of Lambert. And Noah was drunk with wine, and his ark was open. Bella. None of that here. Come to the wrong shop. Lynch. Let him alone. He's back from Paris. Zoe. Runs to Stephen and links him. Oh, go on. Give us some parley-vous. Stephen claps hat on head and leaps over the fireplace where he stands with shrugged shoulders, finny hands outspread, a painted smile on his face. Lynch. Pommeling on the sofa. <laughs> Stephen gabbles with marionette jerks. Thousand places of entertainment to expense your evenings with lovely ladies sailing gloves and other things. Perhaps hers heart, beer chops, perfect fashionable house, very eccentric, where lots cocottes, beautiful, dressed much about princesses like a dancing can-can, and walking there, Parisian clowneries, extra foolish for bachelors. <coughs> Foreigns the same, if talking a poor English, how much smart they are on things love and sensations voluptuous. Mister's very select for his pleasure must have visit heaven and hell show with mortuary candles and they tears silver which occur every night. Perfectly shocking, terrific of religions, things mockery seen in universal world. All chic womans which arrive full of modesty then disrobe and squeal loud to see vampire man debauch and unbay fresh young with de soutre blanc. He clacks his tongue loudly. Oh la la, ce pif qu'il a. Lynch. Vive le vampire. The whores. Bravo, parlez-vous. <laughs> Stephen. Grimacing with head back, laughs loudly, clapping himself. Great success of laughing. Angels, much prostitutes like, and holy apostles, big damn ruffians. Demi mondaine, a nicely handsome sparkling of diamonds, very amiable costume. Or do you are fond better, which belongs they modern's pleasure turpitude of old man's? He points about him with grotesque gestures, which Lynch and the whores reply to. Kachuk statue woman reversible or life size Tom Pete Tom of Virgin's nudity is very lesbic the kiss five ten times enter gentlemen to see and mirror every position trapezes all that machine there besides also if desire act awfully bestial butcher's boy pollutes in warm veal liver or omelette on the belly pièce de Shakespeare Bella clapping her belly sinks back on the sofa with a shout of laughter an omelette on the <laughs> Stephen. Mincingly. I love you, sir, darling. Speak you Englishman tongue for double entente cordiale. Oh, yes, mon loup. How much cost Waterloo, water closet? He ceases suddenly and holds up a forefinger. Bella. <laughs> Omelette. <laughs> the whores. Encore. Encore. <laughs> Stephen. Mark me. I dreamt of a watermelon. Zoe. Go abroad. And love. A foreign lady. Lynch. Across the world for a wife. Flory. Dreams goes by countries. Stephen. Extends his arms. It was here, street of harlots. In Serpentine Avenue, Beelzebub showed me her, a fubsy widow. Where is the red carpet spread? Bloom. Approaching Stephen. Look. Stephen. No, I flew, my foes beneath me and ever shall be. World without end. He cries, Parker, free. Bloom. I say, look. Stephen. Break my spirit, will he? Oh, merde alors. He cries, his vulture talons sharpened. Hola, idio. Simon Dedalus's voice hellos in answer, somewhat sleepy but ready. Simon. That's all right. 
He swoops uncertainly through the air, wheeling, uttering cries of heartening, on strong, ponderous buzzard wings. Ho, oh boy, are you going to win? Hoop! Chat! Stable with those half-casts. Wouldn't let them within a ball of an ass. Head up. Keep our flag flying. An eagle jewels volant in a field argent displayed. Ulster king at arms. Hi hoop! He makes the beagles call. <laughs> giving tongue. Bull bull, burble bull, burble bull. Hi boy! The fronds and spaces of the wallpaper file rapidly cross country. A stout fox, drawn from covert, brush pointed, having buried his grandmother, runs swift for the open, bright eyed, seeking badger earth under the leaves. The pack of stag hounds follows, nose to the ground, sniffing their quarry, beagle baying, burbling to be blooded. Ward Union huntsmen and huntswomen live with them, hot for a kill. From Six Mile Point, Flat House, Nine Mile Stone follow the foot people with knotty sticks, hay forks, salmon gaffs, lassos, flock masters with stock whips, bear baiters with tom toms, toreadors with bull swords, gray negroes waving torches. The crowd balls of dicers, crown and anchor players, thimble riggers, broadsmen. Crows and touts, horse bookies and high wizard hats clamor deafeningly. The crowd. Hard of races, racing hard. Ten to one the field. Tommy, look right here. Tommy, look right. Ten to one bar one. Ten to one bar one. Oh, you luck on Spinning Jimmy. Ten to one bar one. Sell the monkey, boys. Sell the monkey. I'll be a ten to one. Ten to one bar one. Dark horse, riderless, bolts like a phantom past the winning post, his mane moon foaming, his eyeballs stars. The field follows a bunch of bucking mounts, skeleton horses, scepter, maximum the second, Zinfandel, the Duke of Westminster's shot over, repulse, the Duke of Beaufort's Ceylon, Prix de Paris. Dwarfs ride them, rusty armored, leaping, leaping in their in their saddles. Last, in a drizzle of rain on broken-winded Isabel Nag, Cock of the North, the favorite, honey-cap, green-jacket, orange-sleeves, Garrett Deasy up, gripping the reins, a hockey-stick at the ready. His nag on spavined, white-gaitered feet jogs along the rocky road. The Orange Lodges. Jeering. Get down and push, mister. Last lap. You'll be home the night. Garrett. Deasy. Bolt upright, his nail-scraped face plastered with postage stamps, brandishes his hockey stick, his blue eyes flashing in the prism of the chandelier as his mount lopes by at schooling gallop. Pervias rectas! A yoke of buckets leopards all over him and his rearing nag, a torrent of mutton broth with dancing coins of carrots, barley, onions, turnips, potatoes. The Green Lodges. Soft day, Sir John. Soft day, Your Honour. Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey pass beneath the windows, singing in discord. Oh, Stephen. Hark, our friend noise in the street. <laughs> Zoe. Holds up her hand. Stop! Private Carr, Private Compton, and Sissy Caffrey. Zoe. That's me. She claps her hands. Dance, dance. She runs to the pianola. Who has top ants? Bloom. Who? Lynch. Handing her coins. Here. Stephen. Cracking his fingers impatiently. Quick, quick, where's my auger's rod? He runs to the piano and takes his ash plant, beating his foot in tripudium. Zoe. Turns the drum handle. There! She drops two pennies in the slot. Gold, pink, and violet lights dart forth. The drum turns purring in low hesitation waltz. Professor Goodwin, in a bow-knotted periwig, in court dress wearing a stained Inverness cape, bent in two from incredible age, totters across the room, his hands fluttering. He sits tinily on the piano stool and lifts and beats handless sticks of arms on the keyboard, nodding with damsel's grace, his bow-knot bobbing. Zoe twirls round herself, heel tapping. Dance. Anybody here for there? Who'll dance? Clear the table. 
The pianola with changing lights plays in waltz time the prelude of My Girl's a Yorkshire Girl. Stephen throws his ash plant on the table and seizes Zoe round the waist. Flory and Bella push the table towards the fireplace. Stephen, arming Zoe with exaggerated grace, begins to waltz her round the room. Bloom stands aside. Her sleeve filling from gracing arms reveals a white flesh flower of vaccination. Between the curtains, Professor Magini inserts a leg, on the toe point of which spins a silk hat. With a deft kick, he sends it spinning to his crown, jaunty hatted skates in. He wears a slate frock coat with claret silk lapels, a gorget of cream tulle, a green low cut waistcoat, stock collar with white kerchief, tight lavender trousers, patent pumps, and canary gloves. In his buttonhole is an immense dahlia. He twirls in reversed directions a clouded cane, then wedges it tight in his oxter. He places a hand lightly on his breastbone, bows, and fondles his flower and buttons. Magini The poetry of motion, art of calisthenics. No connection with Madame Leggett Burns or Levinston's. Fancy dress balls are arranged. Deportment. The Cathy Lanner step. So, watch me my terpsichorean abilities. He minuets forward three paces on tripping bee's feet. Tout le monde en avant. Reverence. Tout le monde en place. The prelude ceases. Professor Goodwin, beating vague arms, shrivels, sinks, his live cape falling about the stool. The air in firmer waltz time sounds. Stephen and Zoe circle freely. The lights change, glow, fide, gold, rosy, violet. The pianola. Two young fellows were talking about their girls, 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 sweethearts they'd left behind. From a corner the morning hours run out, gold-haired, slim-sandaled in girlish blue, wasp-waisted with innocent hands. Nimbly they dance, twirling their skipping ropes. The hours of noon follow in amber-gold, laughing, linked, high hair combs flashing. They catch the sun in mocking mirrors, lifting their arms. Magini. Clip claps, glove silent hands. Carré, avant deux. Breathe evenly. Balance. The morning and noon hours waltz in their places, turning, advancing to each other. Shaping their curves, bowing vis-a-vis, -vis. Cavaliers behind them arch and suspend their arms, With hands descending to touching, rising from their shoulders. Ours. You may touch my... Cavaliers. May I touch your... Ours. Oh, but lightly. Cavaliers. Oh, so lightly. The pianola. My little shy little lass has a waist. Zoe and Stephen turn boldly with looser swing. The twilight hours advance from long land shadows, dispersed, lagging, languid eyed, their cheeks delicate with cypria and false faint bloom. They are in grey gauze with dark bat sleeves that flutter in the land breeze. Magini. Avant huit. Traverse. Salut. Corps de main. Quas. The night hours, one by one, steal to the last place. Morning, noon, and twilight hours retreat before them. They are masked with daggered hair and bracelets of dull bells. Weary, they kerchy kerchy under veils. The bracelets. Hey yo, hey yo. Zoe, twirling her hand to her brow. Oh. Magini. Les tiroirs. Chaine de dame, la corbeille, dos à dos. Arabesquing wearily, they weave a pattern on the floor, weaving, unweaving, curtsying, twirling, simply swirling. Zoe. I'm giddy. She frees herself, droops on a chair. Stephen seizes Flory and turns with her. Magini. Boulangère, les rondes, les ponts, chevaux de bois. Escargot. 
twining, receding, with interchanging hands, the night hours link each, each with arching arms, in a mosaic of movements. Stephen and Flory turn cumbrously. Magini. Dansez avec vos dames, changez de dame, donnez le petit bouquet à votre dame, remerciez. The pianola. Best, best of all, barabam. Kitty. Jumps up. Oh, they played that on the hobby horses at the Miris Bazaar. She runs to Stephen. He leaves Flore brusquely and seizes Kitty. A screaming bittern's harsh high whistle shrieks. Grown grouse gurgling tofts cumbersome whirligig turns slowly the room right round about the room. The pianola. My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Zoe. Yorkshire through and through. Come on, all. She seizes Flory and waltzes her. Stephen. Pas seul. He wheels Kitty into Lynch's arms, snatches up his ash plant from the table, and takes the floor. All wheel, whirl, waltz, twirl. Bloom, Bella, Kitty, Lynch, Flory, Zoe, Jujube, women. Stephen with hat ash plant, frog splits in middle high, kicks with sky kicking mouth shut, hand clasp part under thigh. With clang tinkle boom hammer, tally ho, horn blower, blue green yellow flashes, tofts cumbersome, turns with hobby horse riders from gilded snakes dangled, bowels fandango, leaping spurn soil foot and fall again. The pianola. Though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes. Close clutched, swift, swifter, with glare, blare, flare, scudding, they scoot, loot, shoot, lumbering by barabum. Tootie. Encore, bees, bravo, encore. End of Ulysses 15F. Ulysses 15, G, the seventh of seven parts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, 15, G. Simon. Think of your mother's people. Stephen. Dance of death. Bang, fresh barang, bang of lackey's bell. Horse, nag, steer, piglings, commy on Christ ass, lame crutch and leg, sailor and cockboat, arm folded, rope pulling, hitching swamp hornpipe through and through. Burra bum! On nags, hogs, bell horses, gathering swine. Corny in coffin, steel, shark, stone, one handled Nelson, two tricky Frauen Zimmer, plum stain from pram falling, bawling. Come, he's a champion. Fuse blue peer from barrel. Reverend Evensong, love on hackney jaunt, blazes. Blind, quadrupled bicyclers, dilly with snow cake, no fancy clothes. Then in last switchback, lumbering up and down, mash tub, sort of viceroy and drain, relish for tublum a bumpsha rose, burra bum. The couples fall aside. Stephen whirls giddily. Room whirls back. Eyes closed, he totters. Red rails fly spacewards. Stars all around, suns turn round about. Bright midges dance on walls. He stops dead. Stephen. Ho! Stephen's mother, emaciated. Rises stark through the floor, in leper grey, with a wreath of faded orange blossoms, 
and a torn bridal veil, her face worn and noseless, green with grave mould. Her hair is scant and lank. She fixes her blue-circled hollow eye-sockets on Stephen and opens her toothless mouth, uttering a silent word. A choir of virgins and confessors sing voicelessly. The Choir From the top of a tower, Buck Mulligan, in party-colored jester's dress of puce and yellow, and clown's cap with curling bell, stands gaping at her, a smoking buttered split scone in his hand. Buck Mulligan. She's basely dead. The pity of it. Mulligan makes the afflicted mother. He upturns his eyes. Mercurial Malachi! The mother. With a subtle smile of death's madness. I was once the beautiful May Goulding. I am dead. Stephen. Horror struck. Lima, who are you? No. What bogeyman's trick is this? Buck Mulligan. Shakes his curling cap bell. The mockery of it! King Stokes' body killed a bitch body! She kicked the bucket! Tears of molten butter fall from his eyes onto the scone. Oh, great sweet mother! Epiono Ponton. The mother. Comes nearer, breathing upon him softly, her breath of wetted ashes. All must go through it, Stephen. More women than men in the world. You too. Time will come. Stephen. Choking with fright, remorse, and horror. They say, I killed you, mother. He offended your memory. Cancer did it, not I. Destiny. The mother. A green rill of bile trickling from a side of her mouth. You sang that song to me. Love's bitter mystery. Stephen. Eagerly. Tell me the word, mother, if you know now. The word known to all men. The mother. Who saved you the night you jumped into the train at Dalkey with Paddy Lee? Who had pity for you when you were sad among the strangers? Prayer is all-powerful. 
prayer for the suffering souls in the Ursuline manual and forty days indulgence. Repent, Stephen. Stephen, the ghoul, hyena, the mother. I pray for you in my other world. Get Dilly to make you that boiled rice every night after your brain work. Years and years I loved you. Oh, my son, my firstborn, when you lay in my womb. Zoe. Fanning herself with a great fan. I'm melting. Flory. Points to Stephen. Look, he's white. Bloom. Goes to the window to open it more. Giddy. The mother. With smoldering eyes. Repent! Oh, the fire of hell! Stephen. Panting. His non-corrosive sublimate. The corpse chewer. Raw head and bloody bones. The mother. Her face drawing near and nearer, sending out an ashen breath. Beware! She raises her blackened, withered right arm slowly towards Stephen's breast with outstretched finger. Beware God's hand! A green crab with malignant red eyes sticks deep its grinning claws in Stephen's heart. Stephen. Strangled with rage, his features grow drawn grey and old. Shite. Bloom. At the window. What? Stephen. Ah, non, par exemple. The intellectual imagination, with me all or not at all, non serviam. Flory. Give him some cold water. Wait. She rushes out. The mother. Wrings her hands slowly, moaning desperately. Oh, sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on him. Save him from hell. Oh, divine sacred heart. Stephen. No, no, no. Break my spirit, all of you, if you can. I'll bring you all to heal. The mother. In the agony of her death rattle. Have mercy on Stephen, Lord, for my sake. Inexpressible was my anguish when expiring with love, grief, and agony on Mount Calvary. Stephen. No thung. He lifts his ash plant high, high with, with both, both hands, hands and smashes the chandelier. Time's livid final flame leaps. leaps, and in the following darkness, ruin of all space, shattered glass, and toppling masonry. The gas jet. Foam. Bloom. Stop. Lynch. Rushes forward and seizes Stephen's hand. Here, hold on. Don't run amok. Bella. Police! Stephen, abandoning his ash plant, his head and arms thrown back, stark beats the ground and flies from the room, past the whores at the door. Bella. Screams. After him! The two whores rush to the hall door. Lynch and Kitty and Zoe stampede from the room. They talk excitedly. Bloom follows, returns. The whores. Jammed in the doorway, pointing. Down there! Zoe. Pointing. There! There's something up. Bella. He pays for the lamp. She seizes Bloom's coattail. Here, you were with him. The lamp's broken. Bloom. Rushes to the hall, rushes back. What lamp, woman? A whore. He tore his coat. Bella. Her eyes hard with anger and cupidity, points. He's to pay for that. Ten shillings. You're a witness. Bloom. Snatches up Stephen's ash plant. Me? Ten shillings? Haven't you lifted enough off him? Didn't he? Bella. Loudly. Here, none of your tall talk. This isn't a brothel. A ten shilling house. Bloom. His head under the lamp pulls the chain. Pulling, the gas jet lights up a crushed mauve purple shade. He raises the ash plant. Only the chimney's broken. Here is all he... Bella. Shrinks back and screams. Jesus, don't! Bloom. Warding off a blow. To show you how he hit the paper. There's not sixpence worth of damage done. Ten shillings. Flory. With a glass of water, enters. Where is he? Bella. Do you want me to call the police? Bloom. Oh, I know. Bulldog on the premises. 
but he's a Trinity student, patrons of your establishment, gentlemen that pay the rent. He makes a Masonic sign. Know what I mean? Nephew of the Vice-Chancellor, you don't want a scandal. Bella. Angrily. Trinity, coming down here, ragging after the bull traces and paying nothing. Are you my commander here? Where is he? I'll charge him. Disgrace him, I will. She shouts. Zoe! Zoe! Bloom. Urgently. And if it were your own son at Oxford? Warningly. I know. Bella. Almost speechless. Who are... And cook? Zoe. In the doorway. There's a row on. Bloom. What? Where? He throws a shilling on the table and starts. That's for the chimney. Where? I need mountain air. He hurries out through the hall, the whore's point. Flory follows, spilling water from her tilted tumbler. On the doorstep all the whores clustered talk volubly, pointing to the right where the fog has cleared off. From the left arrives a jingling hackney car. It slows to in front of the house. Bloom, at the hall door, perceives Corny Kelleher, who is about to dismount from the car with two silent lechers. He averts his face. Bella, from within the hall, urges on her whores. They blow icky-licky-sticky-yum-yum kisses. Corny Kelleher replies with a ghastly lewd smile. The silent lechers turn to pay the jarvey. Zoe and Kitty still point right. Bloom, parting them swiftly, draws his caliph's hood and poncho, and hurries down the steps with sideways face. Incog Harun al-Rashid, he flits behind the silent lechers and hastens on by the railings with fleet step of a pard, strewing the drag behind him, torn envelopes drenched in aniseed. The ash-plant marks his stride. A pack of bloodhounds, led by hornblower of Trinity, brandishing a dog-whip in tally-ho cap, and an old pair of grey trousers, follow from far, picking up the scent, nearer, baying, panting at fault, breaking away, throwing their tongues, biting his heels, leaping at his tail. He walks, runs, zigzags, gallops, lugs laid back. He is pelted with gravel, cabbage stumps, biscuit boxes, eggs, potatoes, dead codfish, women's slipper-slappers. After him fresh found the hue and cry zigzag gallops in hot pursuit of follow my leader, 65C, 66C, Night Watch, John Henry Menton, Wisdom Healy, V. B. Dillon, Councillor Nanetti, Alexander Keyes, Larry O'Rourke, Joe Cuff, Mrs. O'Dowd, Pisser Burke, The Nameless One, Mrs. Reardon, The Citizen, Gary Owen, Who Do You Call Him, Strange Face, Bella That's Alike, Saw Him Before, Chap With A Wen, Chris Callanan, Sir Charles Cameron, Benjamin Dollard, Lenahan, Bartell Darcy, Joe Hines, Red Murray, Editor Braden, T. M. Healy, Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, John Howard Parnell, The Reverend Tin Salmon, Professor Jolly, Mrs. Breen, Dennis Breen, Theodore Purefoy, Mina Purefoy, The Western Row Postmistress, C. P. McCoy, Friend of Lions, Hoppy Hollihan, Man in the Street, Other Man in the Street, Football Boots, Pugnose Driver, Rich Protestant Lady, Davy Byrne, Mrs. Ellen McGuinness, Mrs. Joe Gallagher, George Lidwell, Jimmy Henry on Corns, Superintendent Larrisy, Father Cowley, Crofton out of the Collector Generals, Dan Dawson, Dental Sergeant Bloom with Tweezers, Mrs. Bob Doran, Mrs. Kennefick, Mrs. Wise Nolan, John Wise Nolan, Handsome Married Woman Rubbed Against White Behind in Clons Keatrum, The Bookseller of Sweets of Sin, Miss Dubidad and She Did Be Dad, Madams Gerald and Stanislaw Moran of Roebuck, The Managing Clerk of Dribbies, Colonel Hayes, Mastiansky, Citron, Penrose, Arnvig Atner, Moses Herzog, Michael e. Garrity, Inspector Troy, Mrs. Galbraith, The Constable of Eccles Street Corner, Old Dr. Brady with Stethoscope, The Mystery Man on the Beach, A Retriever, Mrs. Mary and Dandred, and all her lovers. The Hue and Cry Helter Skelter, Pelter Welter He's Bloom! Stop Bloom! Stop a Bloom! Stop a robber! Hi! Hi! Stop him on the corner! At the corner of Beaver Street, beneath the scaffolding, Bloom, panting, stops on the fringe of the noisy quarreling knot. A lot not knowing a jot, what, hi, hi, row and wrangle round the who, what, brawl all together. Stephen. With elaborate gestures, breathing deeply and slowly. You are my guests. Uninvited. By virtue of the fifth of George and the seventh of Edward. History to blame, fabled by mothers of memory. Private Carr. To Sissy Caffrey. Was he insulting you? Stephen. Addressed her invocative feminine, probably neuter, ungenitive. Voices. No, he didn't. I've seen him. Girl there. 
He was in Mrs. Cohen's. What's up? Soldier and civilian. Sissy Caffrey. I was in company with the soldiers, and they left me to do, you know, and the young man run up behind me. But I'm faithful to the man that's treating me, though I'm only a shilling whore. Stephen. Catches sight of Lynch's and Kitty's heads. Hail, Sisyphus. He points to himself and the others. Poetic. Euro-poetic. Voices. She's faithful, the man. Sissy Capri. Yes, to go with him. And me with a soldier friend. Private Compton. He doesn't want half a thick ear, the blighter. Biff him one, Harry. Private Carr. To Sissy Caffrey. Was he insulting you while me and him were having a piss? Lord Tennyson. Gentleman poet in Union Jack blazer and cricket flannels. Bareheaded, flowing bearded. There's not to reason why. Private Compton. Biff him, Harry. Stephen. To Private Compton. I don't know your name, but you are quite right. Dr. Swift says one man in armor will beat ten men in their shirts. Shirt is Zinnikdosh, part for the whole. Sissy Caffrey. To the crowd. No, I was with the privates. Stephen. Amiably. Why not? The bold soldier boy, in my opinion every lady, for example. Private Carr. His cap awry advances to Stephen. Say, how would it be, Governor? If I was to bash in your jaw. Stephen. Looks up to the sky. How? Very unpleasant. Noble art of self-pretense. Personally, I detest action. He waves his hand. Hand hurts me slightly. Enfin, ce sont vos oignons. To Sissy Caffrey. Some trouble is on here. What is it precisely? Dolly Gray. From her balcony waves her handkerchief, giving the sign of the heroine of Jericho. Cook, son, goodbye. Say form to Dolly. Dream of the girl you left behind, and she will dream of you. The soldiers turn their swimming eyes. Bloom. Elbowing through the crowd, plucks Stephen's sleeve vigorously. Come now, Professor. That car man is waiting. Stephen. Turns. Eh? He disengages himself. Why should I not speak to him or to any human being who walks upright upon this oblate orange? He points his finger. I am not afraid of what I can talk to if I can see his eye, retaining the perpendicular. He staggers a pace back. Bloom. Propping him. Retain your own. Stephen. Laughs emptily. <laughs> My center of gravity is displaced. I have forgotten the trick. Let us sit down somewhere and discuss. Struggle for life is the law of existence, but but human filirenists, notably the Tsar and the King of England, have invented arbitration. He taps his brow. But in here it is I must kill the priest and the king. Biddy the clap. Did you hear what the professor said? He's a professor out of the college. Cunty Kate. I did. I heard that. Biddy the clap. He expresses himself with such marked refinement of phraseology. Cunty Kate. Indeed, yes. And at the same time with such opposite trenchancy. Private Carr. Pulls himself free and comes forward. What's that you're saying about my king? Edward the Seventh appears in an archway. He wears a white jersey on which an image of the Sacred Heart is stitched with the insignia of garter and thistle, golden fleece, elephant of Denmark, Skinner's and Proben's horse, Lincoln's Inn bencher, and ancient and honorable artillery company of Massachusetts. He sucks a red jujube. He is robed as a grand elect perfect and sublime mason with trowel and apron, marked made in Germany. In his left hand he holds a plasterer's bucket on which is printed Défense du Rhiné. A roar of welcome greets him. Edward the Seven. Slowly, solemnly, but indistinctly. Peace, perfect peace. For identification, bucket in my hand. Cheerio, boys. He turns to his subjects. We have come here to witness a clean, straight fight, and we heartily wish both men the best of good luck. Mahak, Makar, Abak. He shakes hands with Private Carr, Private Compton, Stephen, Bloom, and Lynch. General applause. Edward the Seventh lifts his bucket graciously in acknowledgement.
private car. To Stephen. Say it again. Stephen. Nervous, friendly, pulls himself up. I understand your point of view, though I have no king myself for the moment. Here is the age of patent medicines. A discussion is difficult down here. But this is the point. You die for your country. Suppose— He places his arm on Private Carr's sleeve. Not that I wish it for you. But I say, let my country die for me. Up to the present it has done so. I didn't want it to die. Damn death. Long live life. Edward the Seventh. Levitates over heads of slain, in the garb and with a halo of joking Jesus, a white to do in his phosphorescent face. My methods are new and are causing surprise. To make the blind see, I throw dust in their eyes. Stephen. Kings and unicorns. He fills back a pace. Come somewhere and we'll... Uh, what was the girl saying? Private Compton. Hey, Harry, give him a kick in the knackers. Stick one into Jerry. Bloom. To the privates, softly. He doesn't know what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Taken a little more than he's good for him. Absinthe, green-eyed monster. I know him. He's a gentleman, a poet. It's all right. Stephen. Nods, smiling and laughing. Gentleman, patriot, scholar, and judge of impostors. Private car. I don't give a bugger who he is. Private Compton. We don't give a bugger who he is. Stephen. I seem to annoy them. Green rag to a bull. Kevin Egan of Paris in black Spanish tasseled shirt and peeper day's boy's hat signs to Stephen. Kevin Egan. Hello! Bonjour! The vieille ogress with the donjon. Patrice Egan peeps from behind, his rabbit face nibbling a quince leaf. Patrice. Socialist! Don Emile Patrizio Franz Rupert Pope Hennessy. In medieval hauberk, two wild geese volant on his helm, with noble indignation, points a mailed hand against the privates. Where if they was oiks to foot boden? Big grand burkos of John Yellows, Toros coward of gravy! Bloom. To Stephen. Come home, you'll get into trouble. Stephen. Swaying. I don't avoid it. He provokes my intelligence. Biddy the clap. One immediately observes that he is of patrician lineage. The virago. Green above the red, says he. Woofton. The boar. The red's as good as the green, and better. Up the soldiers. Up King Edward. A rough. Laughs. Ha ha ha! Hands up to the wit! The citizen, with a huge emerald muffler and shalila, calls. May the god above send down a dove with teeth as sharp as razors to slit the throats of the English dogs that hanged our Irish leaders. The croppy boy. The rope noose round his neck gripes in his issuing bowels with both hands. I bear no heed to a living thing, but I love my country beyond the king. Rumble, demon barber. Accompanied by two black-masked assistants, advances with gladstone bag, which he opens. Ladies and gents. Cleaver, purchased by Mrs. Percy to slay Mog. Knife, with which Foisin dismembered the wife of a compatriot and hid remains in a sheet in the cellar, the unfortunate female's throat being cut from ear to ear. Phial containing arsenic, retrieved from body of Miss Baron, which sent Seddon to the gallows. He jerks the rope, the assistants leap at the victim's legs and drag him downward. Grunting, the croppy boy's tongue protrudes violently. The croppy boy. Hor hot, hooray, hor hother's hest. He gives up the ghost. A violent erection of the hanged sends gouts of sperm spouting through his death clothes onto the cobblestones. 
Mrs. Bellingham, Mrs. Yelverton Barry, and the Honorable Mrs. Mervyn Tallboys rush forward with their handkerchiefs to sop it up. Rumble. I'm near it myself. He undoes the noose. Rope, which hanged the awful rebel, ten shillings a time, as applied to her royal highness. He plunges his head into the gaping belly of the hanged and draws out his head again, clotted with coiled and smoking entrails. My painful duty has now been done. God save the king. Edward the Seventh dances slowly, solemnly, rattling his bucket, and sings with soft contentment. On coronation day, on coronation day, oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine. Private Car Here, what are you saying about my king? Stephen Throws up his hands. Oh, this is too monotonous. Nothing. He wants my money and my life, though want must be his master for some brutish empire of his. Money I haven't. He searches his pockets vaguely. Gave it to someone. Private car. Who wants your bleeding money? Stephen. Tries to move off. Will someone tell me where I am least likely to meet these necessary evils? Ça se voit aussi à Paris. Not that I... but by St. Patrick... The women's heads coalesce. Old gummy granny in sugar-loaf hat appears seated on a toadstool, the death flower of the potato blight on her breast. Stephen. Aha! I know you, Gamma. Hamlet, revenge, the old sow that eats her farrow. Old gummy granny. Rocking to and fro. Orland, sweetheart, the king of Spain's daughter, Alana. Strangers in my house, bad manners to them. She keens with banshee woe. Mo, oh, oh, horn, oh, oh, horn, silk of the kind. She wails. You met with poor old Ireland, and how does she stand? Oh. Stephen. How do I stand you? The hat-trick. Where's the third person of the Blessed Trinity? Sogoth Arun, the Reverend Carrion Crow. Sissy Caffrey. Shrill. Stop them from fighting! A rough. Our men retreated! Private car. Tugging at his belt. I'll wring the neck of any fucker says a word against my fucking king. Bloom. Terrified. He said nothing, not a word, a pure misunderstanding. The Citizen Erin Gobra Major Tweedy and the Citizen exhibit to each other medals, decorations, trophies of war, wounds. Both salute with fierce hostility. Private Compton Go it, Terry. Do him on the eyes of Prover. Stephen Did I? When? Bloom to the Redcoats. We fought for you in South Africa, Irish missile troops. Isn't that history? Royal Dublin Fusiliers, honoured by our monarch. The Navi. Staggering past. Oh, yes. Oh, God, yes. Oh, make the quarrel crow. Oh, bow. Cast halberdiers and armour thrust forward a pentis of gutted spear points. Major Tweedy, moustached like Turco the Terrible, in bearskin cap with hackle plume and accoutrements, with epaulettes, gilt chevrons, and sabre tashes, his breast bright with medals, toes the line. He gives the pilgrim warriors sign of the Knights Templars. Major Tweedy growls gruffly. Rocks drift, up guards and at them. Maharshala has bars. Private car. I'll do him in. Private Compton. Waves the crowd back. Fair play here. Clean butcher shop. Massed bands blare Gary Owen and God Save the King. Sissy Cap. They're going to fight for me. Country King. The brave and the fair. Biddy the Clap. Methinks yon sable knight will joust it with the best. 
confronting Kate. Blushing deeply. Nay, madam. The ghouls double it and marry St. George for me. Stephen, the harlots cry from street to street shall weave old Ireland's winding sheet. Private car. Loosening his belt, shouts. I'll wring the neck of any fucking bastard. Says a word against my bleeding fucking king. Blue. Shakes Sissy Caffrey's shoulders. Speak, you. Are you struck dumb? You are the link between nations and generations. Speak, woman, sacred life giver. Sissy Caffrey. Alarmed, seizes private car's sleeve. Am I with you? Am I your girl? Sissy's your girl. She cries. Police! Stephen. Ecstatically, to Sissy Caffrey. White thy fanwolves, red thy gown, thy quarrels day tears. Voice. Police! Distant voice. On the fan! On the fan! On fire! On fire! Brimstone fires spring up. Dense clouds roll past. Heavy cutting guns boom. Pandemonium. Troops deploy. Gallop of hoofs. Artillery. Horse commands. Bells clang. Backers shout. Drunkards pull. Halls screech. Foghorns hoot. Cries of valor. Shrieks of dying. Pikes clash on cuirasses. Thieves rob the slain. Birds of prey winging from the sea, rising from marshlands, swooping from Ares, hover screaming, gannets, cormorants, vultures, goshawks, climbing woodcocks, peregrines, merlins, black grass, sea eagles, gulls, albatrosses, barnacle geese. The midnight sun is darkened. The earth trembles. The dead of Dublin, from Prospect and Mount Jerome, in white sheepskin overcoats and black goatfell coats, arise and appear to many. A chasm opens with a noiseless yawn. Tom Rochford, winner, in athlete's singlet and breeches, arrives at the head of the National Hurdle Handicap and leaps into the void. He is followed by a race of runners and leapers. In wild attitudes they spring from the brink. Their bodies plunge. Factory lasses with fancy clothes toss red-hot Yorkshire barra bombs. Society ladies lift their skirts above their heads to protect themselves. Laughing witches in red cutty socks ride through the air on broomsticks. The Quaker lister plasters blisters. It rains dragon's teeth. Armed heroes spring up from furrows. They exchange in amity the pass of knights of the Red Cross and fight duels with cavalry sabres. Wolf Tone against Henry Grattan, Smith O'Brien against Daniel O'Connell, Michael Davitt against Isaac Butt, Justin McCarthy against Parnell, Arthur Griffith against John Redmond, John O'Leary against Lear O'Johnny. Lord Edward Fitzgerald against Lord Gerald Fitzdevitt. The O'Donoghue of the Glens against the Glens of the O'Donoghue. On an eminence, the centre of the earth, rises the felled altar of St. Barbara. Black candles rise from its gospel and epistle horns. From the high barbicans of the tower, two shafts of light fall on the smoke-palled altar-stone. On the altar stone, Mrs. Mina Purefoy, goddess of unreason, lies naked, fettered, a chalice resting on her swollen belly. Father Malachiel Flynn, in a lace petticoat and reversed chasuble, his two left feet back to the front, celebrates camp mass. The Reverend Mr. Hugh Chain's love, M.A., in a plain cassock and mortarboard, his head and collar back to the front, holds over the celebrant's head an open umbrella. Father Malachin O'Flynn In Troibo ad altare diabole The Reverend Mr. Haynes' love To the devil which hath made glad my young days. 
Father Malachin O'Flynn takes from the chalice and elevates a blood-dripping host. Corpus meum. The Reverend Mr. Haynes Love raises high behind the celebrant's petticoat, revealing his grey, bare, hairy buttocks between which a carrot is stuck. My body. The voices of all the damned. From on high, the voice of Adonai calls. Adonai. No. The voices of all the blessed. Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. From on high, the voice of Adonai calls. Adonai. Good. In strident discord, peasants and townsmen of orange and green factions sing Kick the Pope and daily, daily sing to Mary. Private car. With ferocious articulation. I'll do him in. So help me, fucking Christ. I'll ring the bastard fucker's bleeding, blasted, fucking windpipe. Old Gummy Granny. Thrusts a dagger towards Stephen's hand. Remove him, Akusha, at 8.35 a.m. You will be in heaven, and Ireland will be free. She prays. Oh, good God, take him. The retriever, nosing on the fringe of the crowd, barks noisily. Run, 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 run. Bloom. Runs to Lynch. Can't you get him away? Lynch. He likes dialectic, the universal language. Kitty. To Bloom. Get him away, you. He, he won't listen to me. He drags Kitty away. Stephen. Points. Exit Judas. Et laquiose suspended. Bloom. Runs to Stephen. Come along with me now before worse happens. Here's your stick. Stephen. Stick? No. Reason. This feast of pure reason. Sissy Caffrey. Pulling private car. Come on, you're boozed. He insulted me, but I forgive him. Shouting in his ear. I forgive him for insulting me. Bloom. Over Stephen's shoulder. Yes, go. You see he's incapable. Private car. Breaks loose. I'll insult him. He rushes towards Stephen, fist outstretched, and strikes him in the face. Stephen totters, collapses, falls, stunned. He lies prone, his face to the sky his hat rolling to the wall. Bloom follows and picks it up. Major Tweedy. Loudly. Carbine in bucket. Cease fire. Salute. The Retriever. Barking furiously. <laughs> the crowd. Let him up. Ah, don't strike him when he's down. Ah, who? The soldier hit him. He's a professor. Is he hurt it? Don't manhandle him. He's fainted. Okay. What call had the red coat to strike the gentleman? And he, under the influence, let them go and fight the boars. The boar. Listen to who's talking. And the sailor right to go with his girl. He gave the coward's blow. They grab at each other's hair, claw at each other, and spit. The retriever. Barking. Run, run, run. Bloom. Shoves them back loudly. Get back! Stand back! Private Compton. Tugging his comrade. Here, yeah, bugger off, Harry. Here's the cops. Two rain-caped watch, tall, stand in the group. First watch. What's wrong here? Private Compton. We were with this lady and he insulted us. He insulted my chum. The retriever barks. <laughs> Sissy Caffrey. With expectation. Is he bleeding? A man. Rising from his knees. No. Gone off. He'll come to all right. Bloom. Glances sharply at the man. Leave him to me. I can easily... Second watch. Who are you? Do you know him? Private car. Lurches towards the watch. He insulted my lady friend. Bloom. Angrily. You hit him without provocation. I'm a witness. Constable, take his regimental number. Second watch. 
I don't want your instructions in the discharge of my duty. Private Compton. Pulling his comrade. Here, yeah, bugger off, Harry. Or Binnott will shove you in the lockup. Private Carr. Staggering as he is pulled away. God fuck old Bennett. He's a white-arsed bugger. I don't give a shit for him. First Watch. Takes out his notebook. What's his name? Bloom. Peering over the crowd. I just see a car there. If you give me a hand a second, Sergeant. First Watch. Name and address? Corny Kelleher, weepers round his hat, a death wreath in his hand, appears from the bystanders. Bloom. Quickly. Oh, the very man. He whispers. Simon Daedalus' son, a bit sprung. Get those policemen to move those loafers back. Second Watch. Not Mr. Kelleher. Corny Kelleher. To the watch with drawling eye. Oh, that's all right. I know him. Won a bit on the races. Gold cup. Throw away. He laughs. <laughs> Twenty to one. Do you follow me? First watch. Turns to the crowd. Here, yeah, what are you all gaping at? Move on out of that. The crowd disperses slowly, muttering down the lane. Corny Kelleher. Leave it to me, Sergeant. That'll be all right. He laughs, shaking his head. We were often as bad ourselves, eh? Or worse. What, eh? What? First watch. Laughs. I suppose so. <laughs> Corny Kelleher. Nudges the second watch. Come on, wipe your name off the slate, hmm? He lilts, wagging his head. <laughs> With my turaloom, 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 turaloom. What, eh? Do you follow me? Second watch. Genially. Ah, sure we were, too. Corny Kelleher. Winking. <laughs> boys will be boys. I have got a car round there. Second watch. All right, Mr. Kelleher. Good night. Corny Kelleher. I see to that. Bloom. Shakes hands with both of the watch in turn. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. He mumbles confidentially. We don't want any scandal, you understand. Father is a well-known, highly respected citizen. Just a little wild oats, you understand. First watch. I understand, sir. Second watch. That's all right, sir. First watch. It was only in case of corporal injuries I'd have to report her to the station. <laughs> Bloom. Nods rapidly. Naturally, quite right. Only your bounden duty. Second watch. It's our duty. Corny Kelleher. Good night, men. The watch. Saluting together. Not, gentlemen. They move off with slow, heavy tread. Bloom. Blows. Providential, you came on the scene. You have a car? Corny Kelleher. Laughing, pointing his thumb over his right shoulder to the car brought up against the scaffolding. <laughs> Two commercials that were standing fizz and jammets, like princes, Faith. One of them lost two quid on the race, drowning his grief, and were on for a go with the jolly girls. So I landed them up on Bean's car and down to Night Town. Bloom. I was just going home by Gardiner Street when I happened to... Corny Kelleher. Laughs. <laughs> sure, they wanted me to join in with the moths. <laughs> oh, by God, says I, not for all the staggers like myself and yourself. He laughs again and leers with lackluster eye. <laughs> Thanks be to God we have it in the house, what, eh? <laughs> Do you follow me? <laughs> Bloom. Tries to laugh. He, 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 yes. Matter of fact, I was just visiting an old friend of mine there, Virag. You don't know him. Poor fellow, he's laid up for the past week. And we had a liquor together, and I was just making my way home. The horse neighs. The horse. Ho, 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 ho. Ho, ho, ho. Corny Kelleher. Sure, it was being our Jarvey there that told me after we left this two commercials in Mrs. Cohen's, and I told him to pull up and got off to sea. He laughs, 
<laughs> the sober horse driver is a specialty. Will I give him a lift home? Where does he hang out? Somewhere in Cabra, what? Bloom. No, in Sandy Cove, I believe, from what he let drop. Stephen, prone, breathes to the stars. Corny Kelleher, a squint, drawls at the horse. Bloom in gloom looms down. Corny Kelleher. Scratches his nape. Sandy Cove! He bends down and calls to Stephen. Eh? Hey? He calls again. Eh, hey, he's covered with shavings anyhow. Take care they didn't lift anything off him. Bloom. No, no, no. I have his money and his hat here and stick. Corny Kelleher. Ah, oh, well, he'll get over it. No boards broken. Well, I'll shove along. He laughs. <laughs> I've a rendezvous in the morning, burying the dead. Safe home. The horse. Nays. Ho, ho, ho. Bloom. Good night. I'll just wait and take him along in a few. Corny Kelleher returns to the outside car and mounts it. The horse harness jingles. Corny Kelleher. From the car, standing. Night! Bloom. Night. The Javi chucks the reins and raises his whip encouragingly. The car and horse back slowly, awkwardly, and turn. Corny Kelleher, on the side seat, sways his head to and fro in sign of mirth at Bloom's plight. The Javi joins in the mute pantomimic merriment, nodding from the farther seat. Bloom shakes his head in mute, mirthful reply. With thumb and palm, Corny Kelleher reassures that the two bobbies will allow the sleep to continue for what else is to be done. With a slow nod, Bloom conveys his gratitude, as that is exactly what Stephen needs. The car jingles Turaloom around the corner of the Turaloom Lane. Corny Kelleher again reassure looms with his hand. Bloom with his hand assure looms Corny Kelleher that he is with their Turaloo Lulu Lay. Bloom holding in his hand Stephen's hat, festooned with shavings and ash plant, stands irresolute. Then he bends to him and shakes him by the shoulder. Bloom. Hey, ho! There is no answer. He bends again. Mr. Daedalus! There is no answer. The name, if you call, somnambulist. He bends again and, hesitating, brings his mouth near the face of the prostrate form. Stephen! There is no answer. He calls again. Stephen! Stephen! Groans. Who? Black Panther? Vampire. He sighs and stretches himself. <sighs> then murmurs thickly with prolonged vowels. Who drive Fergus now, and pierce wood's woven shade? He turns on his left side, sighing, doubling himself together. Bloom. Poetry. Well educated. Pity. He bends again and undoes the buttons of Stephen's waistcoat. To breathe. He brushes the wood shavings from Stephen's clothes with a light hand and fingers. One pound seven. Not hurt anyhow. He listens. What? Stephen. Murmurs. Shadows. The woods. White breast. Dim sea. He stretches out his arms, sighs again, and curls his body. Bloom, holding the hat and ash plant, stands erect. A dog barks in the distance. Bloom tightens and loosens his grip on the ash plant. He looks down on Stephen's face and form. Bloom. Communes with the night. Face reminds me of his poor mother in the shady wood. The deep white breast. Ferguson, I think I caught. A girl, some girl. Best thing could happen him. He murmurs. Swear that I will always hail, ever conceal, never reveal any part or parts, art or arts. He murmurs. In the rough sands of the sea, a cable toes length from the shore, where the tide ebbs and flows. Silent, thoughtful, alert, he stands on guard, 
his fingers at his lips, in the attitude of secret master. Against the dark wall a figure appears slowly, a fair boy of eleven, a changeling, kidnapped, dressed in an eaten suit, with glass shoes and a little bronze helmet, holding a book in his hand. He reads from right to left, inaudibly, smiling, kissing the page. Bloom. Wonderstruck. Calls inaudibly. Rudy. Rudy. Gazes, unseeing, into Bloom's eyes, and goes on reading, kissing, smiling. He has a delicate, mauve face. On his suit he has diamond and ruby buttons. In his free left hand he holds a slim ivory cane with a violet bow-knot. A white lambkin peers out of his waistcoat pocket. End of Ulysses 15 Credits for Ulysses 15F and 15G The editing was done in ten segments, first, fifth, and sixth segments, with The Woods, The Dance, and The Ghost, were edited by Anita Roy Dobbs. Second and fourth segments with The Brothel and The Race were edited and sound designed by Stefan Mubius. Third and tenth segments with The Affair and The End were edited by Gesina. Seventh segment with The Chase was edited by The Good Reverend Doctor. Eighth and ninth segments with The Kings and The Fight were edited and sound designed by Annalika. Readers for 15F and 15G were Character Identifications read by Chip Narration read by Gesina, John Greenman, and Anita Roy Dobbs Bloom read by David Barnes Stephen read by Alex Foster Kitty read by Kristen Lemoyne Flory read by Alicia Zoe read by Catherine Eastman Lynch read by Stefan Mubius Bella, list of names and sundry characters, read by Kim Zuckert. Marion, read by Nicole Doolin. Boylan, read by Rayner. Private Carr, read by Matthew Shepard. Private Compton, read by Seth Woodworth. Sissy Caffrey, read by Kara Schallenberg. McGinney, read by Hugh McGuire. The Mother, read by Cynthia Lyons. Additional sundry characters and background voices, read by Peter Yearsley. Martin Cunningham, Stefan Mubius, Kim Zuckert, Ted DeLorme, Hajduk, John Greenman, Tina Tilney, Annie Coleman, The Good Reverend Doctor, Mark Smith, Esther, Cecilia, Gesina, Anita Roy Dobbs, Kristen Lemoyne, Catherine Eastman, and Peter Eastman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesina. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 16, Part 1. Preparatory to anything else, Mr. Bloom brushed off the greater bulk of the shavings, and handed Stephen the hat and ash-plant, and bucked him up generally in orthodox Samaritan's fashion, which he very badly needed. His, Stephen's, mind was not exactly what you would call wandering, but a bit unsteady, and on his expressed desire for some beverage to drink, Mr. Bloom, in view of the hour it was, and there being no pump of vatry water available for their ablutions, let alone drinking purposes, hit upon an expedient by suggesting, off the reel, the propriety of the cabman's shelter, as it was called, hardly a stone throw away, near Butbridge, where they might hit upon some drinkables, in the shape of a milk and soda, or a mineral. But how to get there was the rub. For the nonce he was rather nonplussed, but inasmuch as the duty plainly devolved upon him to take some measures on the subject, he pondered suitable ways and means during which Stephen repeatedly yawned. So far as he could see, he was rather pale in the face, 
so that it occurred to him as highly advisable to get a conveyance of some description, which would answer to their then condition. Both of them being E.D.'d, particularly Stephen, always assuming that there was such a thing to be found. Accordingly, after a few such preliminaries as brushing, in spite of his having forgotten to take up his rather soap-suddy handkerchief after it had done yeoman service on the shaving line, they both walked together along Beaver Street, or, more properly, Lane, as far as the farriers, and then, and the distinctly fetid atmosphere of the livery stables at the corner of Montgomery Street, where they made tracks to the left, from thence debouching into Amiens Street round the corner of Dan Bergen's. But, as he confidently anticipated, there was not a sign of a Jehu plying for hire anywhere to be seen except a four-wheeler, probably engaged by some fellows inside of this spree, outside the North Star Hotel, and there was no symptom of its budging a quarter of an inch, when Mr. Bloom, who was anything but a professional whistler, endeavoured to hail it by emitting a kind of a whistle, holding his arms arched over his head twice. This was a quandary, but, bringing common sense to bear on it, evidently there was nothing for it, but to put a good face on the matter, and foot it, which they accordingly did. So, bevelling around by mullets and the signal-house, which they shortly reached, they proceeded perforce in the direction of Amiens Street Railway Terminus, Mr. Bloom being handicapped by the circumstance that one of the back buttons of his trousers had, to vary the time-honoured adage, gone the way of all buttons, though entering thoroughly into the spirit of the thing, he heroically made light of the mischance. So as neither of them were particularly pressed for time, as it happened, and the temperature refreshing since it cleared up after the recent visitation of Jupiter Pluvius, they dandered along past by where the empty vehicle was waiting, without a fare or a jarvey. As it so happened, a Dublin United Tramways Company's Sandstrewer happened to be returning, and the elder man recounted to his companion, apropos of the incident, his own truly miraculous escape of some little while back. They passed the main entrance of the Great Northern Railway Station, the starting point for Belfast, where of course all traffic was suspended at that late hour, and passing the back door of the morgue, a not very enticing locality, not to say gruesome to a degree, more especially at night, ultimately gained the dock tavern and in due course turned into Store Street, famous for its C Division police station. Between this point and the high at present unlit warehouses of Beresford Place, Stephen thought to think of Ibsen, associated with Baird's the stonecutters in his mind somehow in Talbot Place, first turning on the right, where the other, who was acting as his Fidus Arcatis, inhaled with internal satisfaction the smell of James Rook's city bakery, situated quite close to where they were, the very palatable odour indeed of our daily bread, of all commodities of the public, the primary and most indispensable. Bread, the staff of life, earn your bread, oh tell me where is fancy bread, at Rourke's the baker's, it is said. En route to his taciturn, and, not to put too fine a point on it, not yet perfectly sober companion, Mr. Bloom, who at all events was in complete possession of his faculties, never more so, in fact, disgustingly sober, spoke a word of caution read the dangers of night-town, women of ill fame, and swell mobsmen, which, barely permissible once in a while, though not as a habitual practice, was of the nature of a regular death-trap for young fellows of his age, particularly if they had acquired drinking habits, under the influence of liquor, unless you knew a little jiu-jitsu for every contingency, as even a fellow on the broad of his back could administer a nasty kick if he didn't look out. Highly providential was the appearance on the scene of Corny Callagher, when Stephen was blissfully unconscious, but for that man in the gap, turning up at the eleventh hour, the fini might have been, that he might have been a candidate for the accident ward, or, failing that, the bridewell, and an appearance in the court next day, before Mr. Tobias, 
or he being the solicitor rather, old wall, he meant to say, or Mahoney, which simply spelt ruined for a chap when he got bruited about. The reason he mentioned the fact was that a lot of those policemen, whom he cordially disliked, were admittedly unscrupulous in the service of the Crown, and, as Mr. Bloom put it, recalling a case or two in the A Division in Glan Brussels Street, prepared to swear a hole through a ten-gallon pot. Never on the spot when wanted, but in quiet parts of the city, Pembroke Road, for example, the guardians of the law were well in evidence, the obvious reason being they were paid to protect the upper classes. Another thing he commented on was equipping soldiers with firearms or sidearms of any description liable to go off at any time, which was tantamount to enticing them against civilians, should by any chance they fall out over anything. You frittered away your time, he very sensibly maintained, and health, and also character, besides which the squandermania of the thing, fast women of the demi-monde, ran away with a lot of LSD into the bargain, and the greatest danger of all was who you got drunk with, though, touching the much-vexed question of stimulants. He relished a glass of choice old wine in season as both nourishing and blood-making, and possessing aperient virtues, notably a good burgundy, which he was a staunch believer in. Yet never beyond a certain point where he invariably drew the line, as it simply led to trouble all round to say nothing of your being at the tender mercy of others, practically. Most of all, he commented adversely on the desertion of Stephen by all his pub-hunting confrères, but one, a most glaring piece of ratting on the part of his brother Medicus, under all the circs. And that one was Judas, Stephen said, who up to then had said nothing whatsoever of any kind. Discussing these and kindred topics, they made a bee-line across the back of the custom-house, and passed under the loop-line bridge, where a brazier of coke burning in front of a sentry-box or something like one attracted their rather lagging footsteps. Stephen, of his own accord, stopped for no special reason to look at the heap of barren cobblestones, and by the light emanating from the brazier he could just make out the darker figure of the corporation watchman inside the gloom of the sentry-box. He began to remember that this has happened, or had been mentioned as having happened before, but it cost him no small effort before he remembered that he recognized in the sentry a quondam friend of his father's, Gumley. To avoid a meeting, he drew nearer to the pillars of the railway bridge. "'Someone saluted you,' Mr. Bloom said. A figure of middle height on the prowl evidently under the arches saluted again, calling, Night! Stephen, of course, started rather dizzily and stopped to return the compliment. Mr. Bloom actuated by motives of inherent delicacy, inasmuch as he always believed in minding his own business, moved off, but nevertheless remained on the qui vive with just a shade of anxiety, though not funkyish in the least. Though unusual in the Dublin area, he knew it was not by any means unknown for desperadoes, who had next to nothing to live on, to be abroad waylaying and generally terrorizing peaceable pedestrians by placing a pistol at the head in some secluded spot outside the city proper, famished loiterers of the Thames embankment category. They might be hanging about there, or simply marauders, ready to decamp with whatever boodle they could, in one fell swoop of a moment's notice, your money or your life, leaving you there to point a moral, gagged and garroted. Stephen, that is, when the accosting figure came to close quarters, though he was not in an over-sober state himself, recognized Corley's breath, redolent of rotten corn-juice. Lord John Corley, some called him, and his genealogy came about in this wise. He was the eldest son of Inspector Corley of the G Division, lately deceased, who had married a certain Catherine Brophy, the daughter of a Luth farmer. His grandfather, Patrick Michael Corley of New Ross, had married the widow of a publican there, whose maiden name had been Catherine, also, Talbot. 
Rumour had it, though not proved, that she descended from the house of the Lords Talbot de Malahide, in whose mansion, really an unquestionably fine residence of its kind, and well worth seeing, her mother or aunt, or some relative, a woman, as the tale went, of extreme beauty, had enjoyed the distinction of being in service in the wash-kitchen. This, therefore, was the reason why the still comparatively young, though dissolute man, who now addressed Stephen, was spoken of by some with facetious proclivities, as Lord John Corley. Taking Stephen on one side, he had the customary doleful ditty to tell. Not as much as a farthing to purchase a night's lodgings. His friends had all deserted him. Furthermore, he had a row with Lenehan, and called him to Stephen a mean bloody swab, with a sprinkling of a number of other uncalled-for expressions. He was out of a job and implored of Stephen to tell him where on God's earth he could get something, anything at all, to do. No, it was the daughter of the mother in the wash-kitchen that was four-sister to the heir of the house, or else they were connected through the mother in some way, both occurrences happening at the same time, if the whole thing wasn't a complete fabrication from start to finish. Anyhow, he was all in. I wouldn't ask you only, pursued he, on my solemn oath, and God knows I'm on the rocks. There'll be a job tomorrow or next day, Stephen told him, in a boys' school at Dalkey, for a gentleman usher. Mr. Garrett Deasy. Try it. You may mention my name. Ah, oh, God, Corley replied. Sure, I couldn't teach in a school, man. I was never one of your bright ones, he added with a half-laugh. I got stuck twice in the junior at the Christian Brothers. I have no place to sleep myself, Stephen informed him. Corley, at the first go-off, was inclined to suspect it was for something to do with Stephen being fired out of his digs for bringing in a bloody tart off the street. There was a doss house in Marlborough Street, Mrs. Maloney's, but it was only a tanner touch and full of undesirables. But McConaughey told him he got a decent enough do in the Brazen Head over in Wine Tavern Street, which was distantly suggestive to the person addressed of Friar Bacon for a bob. He was starving too, though he hadn't said a word about it. Though this sort of thing went on every other night, or very near it, still Stephen's feelings got the better of him in a sense, though he knew that Corley's brand new rigmarole on a par with the others, was hardly deserving of much credence. However, how it ignarus malorum miseris succurere, disco, etc., etc., as the Latin poet remarks, especially as luck would have it, he got paid his screw after every middle of the month on the 16th, which was the date of the month, as a matter of fact, though a good bit of the wherewithal was demolished. But the cream of the joke was nothing would get it out of Corley's head that he was living in affluence, and hadn't a thing to do but hand out the needful. Whereas, he put his hand in a pocket anyhow, not with the idea of finding any food there, but thinking he might lend him anything up to a bob or so, in lieu so that he might endeavour at all events and get sufficient to eat. But the result was in the negative, for, to his chagrin, he found his cash missing. A few broken biscuits were all the result of his investigation. He tried his hardest to recollect for the moment whether he had lost as well he might have, or left because in that contingency it was not a pleasant lookout. Very much the reverse, in fact. He was altogether too fagged out to institute a thorough search, though he tried to recollect. About biscuits, he dimly remembered. Who now exactly gave them, he wondered, or where was he? Or did he buy? However, in another pocket he came across what he surmised in the dark were pennies, erroneously, however, as it turned out. Those are half-crowns, man, Corley corrected him. And so, in point of fact, they turned out to be. Stephen anyhow lent him one of them. Thanks, Corley answered. You're a gentleman. I'll pay you back one time. Who's that with you? I saw him a few times in the bleeding house in Camden Street with Boylan, the bill-sticker. 
You might put in a good word for us, to get me taken on there. I'd carry a sandwich board, only the girl in the office told me, they're full up for the next three weeks, man. God, you've to book ahead, man. You'd think it was for the Carl Rosa. I don't give a shite anyway, so long as I get a job, even as a crossing sweeper. Subsequently, being not quite so down in the mouth, after the two and six he got, he informed Stephen about a fellow by the name of Bags Komiski, that he said Stephen knew well out of Fulham's, the ship chandlers, bookkeeper there that used to be often round in Nagel's back with a Mara, and a little chap with a stutter the name of Ty. Anyhow, he was lagged the night before last, and fined ten bob for a drunken disorderly, and refusing to go with the constable. Mr. Bloom, in the meanwhile, kept dodging about in the vicinity of the cobblestones near the brazier of coke, in front of the corporation watchman's sentry-box, who, evidently a glutton for work, it struck him, was having a quiet, fortry winks, for all intents and purposes on his own private account, while Dublin slept. He threw an odd eye at the same time, now and then, at Stephen's anything but immaculately attired interlocutor, but if he had seen that nobleman somewhere or other, though where he was not in a position to truthfully state, nor had he the remotest idea when. Being a level-headed individual, who could give points to not a few in point of shrewd observation, he also remarked on his very dilapidated hat and slouchy wearing apparel, generally testifying to a chronic impecuniosity. Palpably, he was one of his hangers-on, but for the matter of that, it was merely a question of one preying on his next-door neighbour all round, in every deep, so to put it, a deeper depth, and for the matter of that, if the man in the street chanced to be on the dock himself, penal servitude, with or without the option of a fine, would be a very rara vide altogether. In any case, he had a consummate account of cool assurances, intercepting people at that hour of the night or morning. Pretty thick, that was, certainly. The pair parted company, and Stephen rejoined Mr. Bloom, who, with his practised eye, was not without perceiving that he had succumbed to the blandiloquence of the other parasite. Alluding to the encounter, he said laughingly, Stephen, that is, he is down on his luck. He asked me to ask you to ask somebody named Boylan, a bill-sticker, to give him a job as a sandwich man. At this intelligence, in which he seemingly evinced little interest, Mr. Bloom gazed abstractedly for the space of a half a second or so in the direction of a bucket dredger, rejoicing in the far-famed name of Ablana, moored alongside Custom House Quay, and quite possibly out of repair, whereupon he observed evasively, "'Everybody gets their own ration of luck,' they say. Now you mention it, his face was familiar to me. But, leaving that for the moment, how much did you part with?' he queried if I'm not too inquisitive. Half a crown, Stephen responded. I dare say he needs it to sleep somewhere. Needs, Mr. Bloom ejaculated, professing not the least surprise at the intelligence. I can quite credit the assertion, and I guarantee he invariably does. Everyone according to his needs, or everyone according to his deeds. But talking about things in general, where, he added with a smile, Will you sleep yourself? Walking to Sandy Cove is out of the question. And even supposing you did, you won't get in after what occurred in Westland Row Station. Simply fag out there for nothing. I don't mean to presume to dictate you in the slightest degree, but why did you leave your father's house? To seek misfortune, was Stephen's answer. I met your respected father on a recent occasion. Mr. Bloom diplomatically returned, today, in fact, or to be strictly accurate, on yesterday. Where does he live at present? I gathered in the course of conversation that he had moved. I believe he is in Dublin somewhere, Stephen answered unconcernedly. Why? A gifted man, Mr. Bloom said of Mr. Dedalus, senior, in more respects than one, and a born raconteur, if ever there was one. He takes great pride, quite legitimate, out of you. 
You could go back, perhaps, he hazarded, still thinking of the very unpleasant scene in Westland Road Terminus, when it was perfectly evident that the other two, Mulligan, that is, and that English truest friend of his, who evidently you could, their third companion, was patently trying, as if the whole bawly station belonged to them, to give Stephen the slip in the confusion, which they did. There was no response forthcoming to the suggestion, however, such as it was, Stephen's mind's eye being too busily engaged in repicturing his family hearth the last time he saw it, with his sister Dilly, sitting by the ingle, her hair hanging down, waiting for some weak Trinidad shell cocoa that was in the suit-coated kettle to be done, so that she and he could drink it with the oatmeal water for milk, after the Friday herrings they had eaten at two a penny with an egg apiece for Maggie, Booty, and Katie. The cat, meanwhile, under the mangle, devouring a mess of eggshells and charred fish-heads and bones on a square of brown paper, in accordance with the third precept of the church, to fast and abstain on the days commanded, it being quarter-tense, or if not, ember days, or something like that. No, Mr. Bloom repeated again, I wouldn't personally repose much trust in that boon companion of yours, who contributes the humorous element. Dr. Mulligan, as a guide, philosopher, and friend, if I were in your shoes, he knows which side his bread is buttered on, though in all probability he never realized what it is to be without regular meals. Of course he didn't notice as much as I did, but it wouldn't occasion me the least surprise to learn that a pinch of tobacco or some narcotic was put in your drink for some ulterior object. He understood, however, from all he heard, that Dr. Mulligan was a versatile all-round man, by no means confined to medicine only who was rapidly coming to the fore in his line, and, if the report was verified, bade fair to enjoy a flourishing practice in the not-too-distant future as a tony medical practitioner, drawing a handsome fee for his services, in addition to which professional status, his rescue of that man from certain drowning by artificial respiration, and what they call first aid at Scaris, or Malahide, was it? was, he was bound to admit, an exceedingly plucky deed, which he could not too highly praise, so that, frankly, he was utterly at a loss to fathom what earthly reason could be at the back of it, except, he put down, to sheer cussedness or jealousy, pure and simple, except it simply amounts to one thing, and he is what they call picking your brains, he ventured to throw out. The guarded glance of half-solitude, half-curiosity, augmented by friendliness, which he gave at Stephen's, at present morose expression of features, did not throw a flood of light, none at all, in fact, on the problem as to whether he had let himself be badly bamboozled to judge by two or three low-spirited remarks he let drop, or the other way about saw through the affair, and for some reason or other best known to himself, allowed matters to more or less. Grinding poverty did have that effect, and he more than conjectured that, high educational abilities though he possessed, he experienced no little difficulty in making both ends meet. Adjacent to the men's public urinal, they perceived an ice-cream car, round which a group of presumably Italians in heated altercation were getting rid of voluble expressions in their vivacious language, in a particularly animated way there being some little differences between the parties. Putana Madonna, che ci dia i quattrini, o ragione, culo rotto, intendiamoci, mezzo sovrano più, dice lui, pero, mezzo, farabuto, mortacci sui, ma ascolta, cinque la testa più. Mr. Bloom and Stephen entered the cabman's shelter, an unpretentious wooden structure, where, prior to then, he had rarely, if ever, been before, the former having previously whispered to the latter a few hints anent the keeper of it, said to be the once famous Skin the Goat Fitzharris, the Invincible, though he could not vouch for the actual facts, which quite possibly there was not one vestige of truth in. A few moments later saw our two noctambules safely seated in a discreet corner 
only to be greeted by stares from the decidedly miscellaneous collection of waifs and strays, and other nondescript specimens of the genus Homo, already there engaged in eating and drinking diversified by conversation, for whom they seemingly formed an object of marked curiosity. Now touching a cup of coffee, Mr. Bloom ventured to plausibly suggest, to break the ice, it occurs to me you ought to sample something in the shape of solid food, say a roll of some description. Accordingly, his first act was, with characteristic sang froid, to order these commodities quietly. The hoi polloi of Jarvis, or Steve Dawes, or whatever they were after a cursory examination, turned their eyes apparently dissatisfied away, though one red-bearded, bibulous individual, portion of whose hair was greyish, a sailor probably, still stared for some appreciable time, before transferring his rapt attention to the floor. Mr. Bloom, availing himself of the right of free speech, he having just a bowling acquaintance with the language in dispute, though, to be sure, rather in a quandary over volio, remarked to his protégé in an audible tone of voice, apropos of the battle royal in the street, which was still raging fast and furious. A beautiful language. I mean, for singing purposes. Why do you not write your poetry in that language? Bella poetria. It is so melodious and full. Bella donna. Voglio. Stephen, who was trying his dead best to yawn if he could, suffering from lassitude generally, replied, To fill the ear of a cow elephant. They were haggling over money. "'Is that so?' Mr. Bloom asked. "'Of course,' he subjoined pensively, at the inward reflection of there being more languages to start with than were absolutely necessary. "'It may be only the southern glamour that surrounds it.' The keeper of the shelter in the middle of this tete-a-tete -tete put a boiling swimming cup of a choice concoction labelled coffee on the table and a rather antediluvian specimen of a bun, or so it seemed." after which he beat a retreat to his counter, Mr. Bloom determining to have a good square look at him later on, so as not to appear to. For which reason he encouraged Stephen to proceed with his eyes, while he did the honours of surreptitiously pushing the cup of what was temporarily supposed to be called coffee gradually nearer him. "'Sounds are impostures,' Stephen said after a pause of some little time, like names, Cicero, Podmore, Napoleon, Mr. Goodbody, Jesus, Mr. Doyle. Shakespeare's were as common as Murphy's. What's in a name? Yes, to be sure, Mr. Bloom unaffectedly concurred. Of course. Our name was changed, too, he added, pushing the so-called roll across. The red-bearded sailor, who had his weather eye on the newcomers, boarded Stephen, whom he had singled out for attention in particular, squarely by asking... And what might your name be? Just in the nick of time, Mr. Bloom touched his companion's boot, but Stephen, apparently disregarding the warm pressure from an unexpected quarter, answered, Deedless. The sailor stared at him heavily for a pair of drowsy, baggy eyes, rather bunged up from excessive use of booze. Preferably good old Hollands and water. You know Simon Deedless? he asked at length. "'I've heard of him,' Stephen said. Mr. Bloom was all at sea for a moment, seeing the others evidently eavesdropping, too. "'He's Irish,' the seaman boldly affirmed, staring still in much the same way and nodding. "'All Irish.' "'All too Irish,' Stephen rejoined. As for Mr. Bloom, he could neither make head or tail of the whole business, and he was just asking himself what possible connection— when the sailor of his own accord turned to the other occupants of the shelter with a remark, I seen him shoot two eggs off two bottles at fifty yards over his shoulder, the left hand dead shot. Though he was slightly hampered by an occasional stammer, and his gestures being also clumsy as it was, still he did his best to explain. Bottles out there, say, fifty yards measured, eggs on the bottles, Cox's gun over his shoulder. Ames. He turned his body half round, shut up his right eye completely. 
Then he screwed his features up some way sideways, and glared out into the night with an unprepossessing cast of countenance. POM! he then shouted once. The entire audience waited, anticipating an additional detonation, there being still a further egg. POM! he shouted twice. Egg, too, evidently demolished, he nodded and winked, adding blood thirstily. Buffalo Bill shoots to kill, never missed, nor he never will. A silence ensued, till Mr. Bloom, for agreeableness' sake, just felt like asking him whether it was for a marksmanship competition like the Bisley. "'Beg pardon,' the sailor said. "'Long ago?' Mr. Bloom pursued, without flinching a hair's breadth. Why? the sailor replied, relaxing to a certain extent under the magic influence of diamond cut diamond. It might be a matter of ten years. He toured the wide world with Hengler's Royal Circus. I've seen him do that in Stockholm. Curious coincidence, Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen unobtrusively. Murphy's my name, the sailor continued. D. B. Murphy. Of Carrigallo. Know where that is? Queenstown Harbour, Stephen replied. That's right, the sailor said. Foot Camden and Foot Carlisle. That's where I hails from. I belongs there. That's where I hails from. My little woman's down there. She's waiting for me, I know. For England, home and beauty. She's my own true wife I haven't seen for seven years now, sailing about. Mr. Bloom could easily picture his advent on this scene, the homecoming to the mariner's roadside sheeling, after having diddled Davy Jones a rainy night with a blind moon. Across the world for a wife. Quite a number of stories there were on that particular Alice Ben Bolt topic, Enoch Arden and Rip Van Winkle. And does anybody hereabouts remember a cow colliery, a favourite and most trying declamation piece, by the way of poor John Casey, and a bit of perfect poetry in its own small way. Never about the runaway wife coming back, however much devoted to the absentee. The face at the window, judge of his astonishment, when he finally did breast the tape, and the awful truth dawned upon him, and end his better half, wrecked in his affections. You little expected me, but I've come to stay and make a fresh start. There she sits, a grass widow, at the self-same fireside. Believes me dead, rocked in the cradle of the deep. And there sits Uncle Chubb or Tomkin, as the case might be, the publican of the crown and anchor, in shirt-sleeves, eating rump-steak and onions. No choir for father. Brew the wind! Her brand-new arrival is on her knee post-mortem child. With a high row and a randy row, and my galloping tearing tendy, oh, bow to the inevitable, grin and bear it. I remain with much love your broken-hearted husband, D. B. Murphy. The sailor, who scarcely seemed to be a Dublin resident, turned to one of the Jarvies with a request. You don't happen to have such a thing as a spared shore about you. The Jarvie addressed, as it happened, had not, but the keeper took a die of plug from his good jacket, hanging on a nail, and the desired object was passed from hand to hand. Thank you, the sailor said. He deposited the quid in his gob, and, chewing and with some slow stammers, proceeded. We come up this morning, eleven o'clock. The three-master rose Vian from Bridgewater with bricks. I shipped to get over. Paid off this afternoon. There's my discharge. See? D. B. Murphy. A. B. S. In confirmation of which statement he extricated from an inside pocket and handed to his neighbour a not very clean-looking folded document. He must have seen a fair share of the world, the keeper remarked, leaning on the counter. Why, the sailor answered upon reflection upon it. I've circumnavigated a bit since I first joined on. I was in the Red Sea. I was in China, North America, and South America. We was chased by pirates one voyage. I seen icebergs plenty, growlers. 
I was in Stockholm and the Black Sea. The Dardanelles under Captain Dalton, the best bloody man that ever scuttled a ship. I seen Russia. Gospody Pomilyu. That's how the Russians praise. You seen queer sights, don't be talking, put in a Jarvey. Why, the sailor said, shifting his partially chewed plug. I seen queer things, too, ups and downs. I seen a crocodile bite the fluke of an anchor, same as I'd chew that quid. He took out of his mouth the pulpy quid, and lodging it between his teeth, bit ferociously. Can! Like that. And I seen man-eaters in Peru that eats corpses and the livers of horses. Look here. Here they are. A friend of mine sent me. He fumbled out a picture postcard from his inside pocket, which seemed to be in its way a species of repository, and pushed it along the table. The printed matter on it stated, Rosa de Indios, Beni, Bolivia. All focused their attention at the scene exhibited, a group of savage women in striped loincloths, squatting, blinking, suckling, frowning, sleeping, amid a swarm of infants. There must have been quite a score of them. Outside some primitive shanties of Osier. Choose coca all day, the communicative tarpaulin added. Stomachs like bread graters. Cuts off their diddies when they can't bear no more children. See them sitting there, stark, ballock naked eating a dead horse's liver raw. His postcard proved the centre of attraction for Messrs. the Greenhorns for several minutes, if not more. Know how to keep them off? he inquired generally. Nobody volunteering a statement, he winked, saying, Glass, that boggles em. Glass. Mr. Bloom, without evincing surprise, unostentatiously turned over the card to peruse that partially obliterated address and postmark. It ran as follows. Tarjeta Postal, Señor Abudin, Galeria Becca, Santiago, Chile. There was no message, evidently, as he took particular notice. Though not an implicit believer in the lurid story narrated, or the egg-sniping transaction, for that matter, despite William Tell and the Lazarillo Don Cesar de Bazan incident depicted in Maritana, on which occasion the former's ball passed through the latter's hat, having detected a discrepancy between his name, assuming he was the person he represented himself to be, and not sailing under false colours, after having boxed the compass on the strict QT somewhere, and the fictitious addressee of the missive which made him nourish some suspicions of our friend's bona fides, nevertheless it reminded him, in a way, of a long-cherished plan he meant to one day realise, some Wednesday or Saturday, of travelling to London via long sea, not to say that he had ever travelled extensively to any great extent. But he was at heart a born adventurer, though by a trick of fate he had consistently remained a landlubber, except you call going to Holyhead, which was his longest. Martin Cunningham frequently said he would work a pass through Egan, but some used hitch or other equally cropped up with the net result that the scheme fell through. But even suppose it did come to planking down the needful and breaking Boyd's heart, it was not so dear, purse permitting, a few guineas at the outside, considering the fare to Mullingar, where he figured on going was five and six there and back. The trip would benefit health on account of the brazing ozone and be in every way thoroughly pleasurable especially for a chap whose liver was out of order, seeing the different places along the route, Plymouth, Falmouth, Southampton, and so culminating in an instructive tour of the sites of the great metropolis, the spectacle of our modern Babylon, where doubtless he would see the greatest improvement, tower, abbey, wealth of Park Lane to renew acquaintance with. Another thing just struck him as a by no means bad notion, was that he might have a gaze around the spot to see about trying to make arrangements about a concert tour of summer music embracing the most prominent pleasure resorts, Margate with mixed bathing and first-rate hydras and spas, Eastbourne, Scarborough, Margate and so on, 
beautiful Bournemouth, the Channel Islands, and similar bijou spots, which might prove highly remunerative. Not, of course, with hole-and-corner scratch company or local ladies on the job. Witness Mrs. C. P. McCoy, type. Lend me your valise and I'll post you the ticket. No, something top-notch, an all-star Irish cast. The Tweedy Flower Grand Opera Company with his own legal consort as leading lady, as a sort of counterblast to the Elster Grimes and moody manners. Perfectly simple matter, and he was quite sanguine of success, providing puffs in the local papers could be managed by some fellow with a bit of a bounce, who could pull the indispensable wires and thus combine business with pleasure. But who? That was the rub. Also, without being actually positive, it struck him a great field was to be opened up, in the lines of opening up new routes to keep pace with the times apropos of the fishguard Rosslare route, which, it was mooted, was once more on the tapis in the circumlocution departments, with the usual quantity of red tape and dilly-dallying, of effete fogidum and dunderheads generally. A great opportunity there certainly was for push and enterprise to meet the travelling needs of the public at large, the average man, that is, Brown, Robinson, and co. It was a subject of regret, and absurd as well on the face of it, and no small blame in our vaunted society that the man in the street, when the system really needed toning up, for the matter of a couple of paltry pounds, was debarred from seeing more of the world they lived in, instead of being always and ever cooped up, since my old stick in the mud took me for a wife. After all, hang it, they had their eleven and more humdrum months of it, and merited a radical change of venue, after the grind of city life and the summer time for choice, when Dame Nature is at her spectacular best, substituting nothing short of a new lease of life. There were equally excellent opportunities for vacationists in that home island, delightful sylvan spots for rejuvenation, offering a plethora of attractions as well as bracing tonic for the system in and around Dublin and its picturesque environs, even Pula Fuca, to which there was a steam tram, but also farther away from the madding crowd in Wicklow, rightly termed the Garden of Ireland, an ideal neighbourhood for elderly wheelmen, so long as it didn't come down, and in the wilds of Donegal, where if report spoke true, the coup d'oeil was exceedingly grand, though the last-named locality was not easily gettable, so that the influx of visitors was not as yet all that it might be, considering the signal benefits to be derived from it, while Howth, with its historic associations and otherwise, Silken Thomas, Grace O'Malley, George the Fourth, rhododendrons several hundred feet above sea level, was a favourite haunt, with all sorts and conditions of men, especially in the spring, when young men's fancy, though it had its own toll of deaths by falling off the cliffs, by design or accidentally, usually, by the way, on their left leg, it being only about three-quarters of an hour run from the pillar. Because, of course, up-to-date tourist travelling was as yet merely in its infancy, so to speak, and the accommodation left much to be desired. Interesting to fathom, it seemed to him from a motive of curiosity, pure and simple, was whether it was the traffic that created the route, or vice versa, or the two sides, in fact. He turned back the other side of the card picture and passed it along to Stephen. I seen a Chinese one time, related the doughty narrator, that had little pills like putty, and he put them in the water, and they opened, and every pill was something different. One was a ship, another was a house, another was a flower. Cooks rats in your soup, he appetizingly added, the chinks does possibly perceiving an expression of dubiosity on their faces, the globetrotter went on, adhering to his adventures. And I seen a man killed in Trieste by an Italian chap, knife in his back, knife like that. While speaking, he produced a dangerous-looking clasp-knife, quite in keeping with his character, and held it in the striking position. In a knocking-shop it was, count of a tyrant between two smugglers, 
fellow hid behind a door, come up behind him, like that. Prepare to meet your God, says he. Chuck! It went into his back, up to the butt. His heavy glance drowsily roamed about, kind of defied their further questions, even should they by any chance want to. That's a good bit of steel, repeated he, examining his formidable stiletto. After which harrowing denouement, sufficient to appall the stoutest, he snapped the blade too, and stowed the weapon in question away, as before in his chamber of horrors, otherwise pocket. They're great for the cold steel, somebody who was evidently quite in the dark said for the benefit of them all. That was why they thought the park murderers of the Invincibles was done by foreigners, on account of them using knives. At this remark, passed obviously in the spirit of where ignorance is bliss, Mr. B. and Stephen, each in his own particular way, both instinctively exchanged meaning glances, in a religious silence of the strictly entre nous variety, however, towards where skin the goat, allies the keeper, alias the keeper, not turning a hair, was drawing spurts of liquid from his boiler affair. His inscrutable face, which was really a work of art, a perfect study in itself, beggaring description, conveyed the expression that he didn't understand one jot of what was going on. Funny, very. End of section 16, part 1 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June 2006Another the card with the native's posa de, another the seaman's discharge. Mr. Bloom, so far as he was personally concerned, was just pondering in pensive mood. He vividly recollected when the occurrence alluded to take place as well as yesterday, roughly some score of years previously in the days of the land troubles, when it took the civilized world by storm. Figuratively speaking, early in the eighties, Eighty-one, to be correct, when he was just turned fifteen. "'Hey, boss,' the sailor broke in, "'give us back them papers.' The request being complied with, he clawed them up with a scrape. "'Have you seen the rock of Gibraltar?' Mr. Bloom inquired. The sailor grimaced, chewing, in a way that might be read as yes, a, or no. "'Ah, you've touched there, too,' Mr. Bloom said. Europa Point, thinking he had, in the hope that the rover might possibly be some reminiscences. But he failed to do so, simply letting spurt a jet of spew into the store dust, and shook his head with a sort of lazy scorn. What year would that be about? Mr. B interrogated. Can you recall the boats? Our soi disant sailor munched heavily a while hungrily before answering, I'm tired of all them rocks in the sea, he said, and boats and ships, salt junk all the time. Tired, seemingly, he ceased, his questioner perceiving that he was not likely to get a great deal of change out of such a wily old customer, fell to wool-gathering on the enormous dimensions of the water about the globe. Suffice it to say that, as a casual glance at the map revealed, it covered fully three-fourths of it, and he fully realized accordingly what it meant to rule the waves. On more than one occasion, a dozen at the lowest, near the North Bull at Dolly Mount, he had remarked a superannuated old salt, evidently derelict, seated habitually near the not particularly redolent sea of the wall staring quite obliviously at it and it at him, dreaming of fresh woods and pastures new, as someone somewhere sings. And he left him wondering why, 
Possibly he had tried to find out the secret for himself, floundering up and down the antipodes, and all that sort of thing, and over and under, well, not exactly under, tempting the fates. And the odds were twenty to nil. There was really no secret about it at all. Nevertheless, without going into the minutiae of the business, the eloquent fact remained that the sea was there in all its glory, and in the natural course of things, somebody or other had to sail on it and fly in the face of providence, though it merely went to show how people usually contrived to load that sort of onus onto the other fellow, like the hell idea and the lottery and insurance which were run on identically the same lines, so that for every reason, if no other, Lifeboat Sunday was a highly laudable institution to which the public at large, no matter where living inland or seaside, as the case may be, having it brought home to them like that, should extend its gratitude also to the harbour-masters and coastguard service who had to man the rigging and push off and out amid the elements, whatever the season when duty called, Ireland expects that every man, and so on, and sometimes had a terrible time of it in the winter-time, not forgetting the Irish lights, Kish and others, liable to capsize at any moment, rounding which he once with his daughter had experienced some remarkably choppy, not to say stormy, weather. There was a fellow sailed with me in the rover, the old sea-dog, himself a rover, proceeded, went ashore and took up a soft job as gentleman's valet, at six quid a month. Them are his trousers I've on me, and he gave me an oilskin and that jackknife. I'm game for that job, shaving and brush-up. I hate roaming about. There's my son now, Danny, run off to sea, and his mother got him took in a draper's in Cork, where he could be drawing easy money. What age is he? queried one hearer, who, by the way, seen from the side, bore a distant resemblance to Henry Campbell, the town clerk, away from the carking cares of office, unwashed, of course, and in a seedy get-up, and a strong suspicion of nose-paint about the nasal appendage. Why, the sailor answered with a slow, puzzled utterance, my son, Danny? He be about eighteen now, way I figure it. The skibbereen father hereupon tore open his great or unclean, anyhow, shirt, with his two hands, and scratched away at his chest, on which was to be seen an image tattooed in blue Chinese ink, intended to represent an anchor. There was lice in that bunk in Bridgewater, he remarked. Sure as nuts. I must get a wash tomorrow or next day. It's them black lads I objects to. I hate those buggers. Suck your blood dry, they does. Seeing they were all looking at his chest, he accommodatingly dragged his shirt more open, so that on top of the time-honoured symbol of the mariner's hope and rest, they had a full view of the figure sixteen, and the young man's side-face looking frowningly, rather. Tattoo, the exhibitor explained. That was done when we were lying becalmed off Odessa, in the Black Sea, under Captain Dalton. Fellow the name of Antonio done that. There he is himself, a Greek. Did it hurt much doing it? One asked the sailor. The worthy, however, was busily engaged in collecting round the, some way in his, squeezing or... See here, he said, showing Antonio. There he is, cursing the mate. And there he is now, he added, the same fellow, pulling the skin with his fingers, some special knack, evidently, and he laughing at a yarn. And in point of fact, the young man named Antonio's livid face did actually look like forced smiling, and the curious effect excited the unreserved admiration of everybody, including Skin the Goat, who this time stretched over. Aye, aye, sighed the sailor, looking down on his manly chest. He's gone too. Et by sharks after. Aye, aye. He let go of the skin so that the profile resumed the normal expression of before. Neat bit of work, one longshore man said. And what's the number for? Loafer number two queried. Eaten alive? A third asked the sailor. Aye, aye, 
sighed again the letter personage, more cheerily this time with some sort of a half-smile for a brief duration, only in the direction of the questioner about the number, et, a Greek he was. And then he added, with rather gallows-bird humour, considering his alleged end, as bad as old Antonio, for he left me on my own yo. The face of a street-walker glazed and haggard under a black straw hat, peered askew round the door of the shelter, palpably reconnoitring on her own, with the object of bringing more grist to her mill. Mr. Bloom, scarcely knowing which way to look, turned away on the moment flusterfied, but outwardly calm, and, picking up from the table the pink sheet of the Abbey Street organ which the Jarvey, if such he was, had laid aside, he picked it up and looked at the pink of the paper, though why pink? His reason for so doing was he recognised on a moment round the door the same face he had caught a fleeting glimpse of that afternoon on Ormond Quay, the partially idiotic female, namely, of the lane who knew the lady in the brown costume does be with you, Mrs. B., and begged the chance of his washing. Also why washing, which seemed rather vague than not your washing. Still candor compelled him to admit he had washed his wife's undergarments when soiled in Hall Street, and women would, and did too, a man's similar garments, initialed with Bewley and Draper's marking ink. Hers were, that is. If they really loved him, that is to say, love me, love my dirty shirt. Still, just then, being on tenterhooks, he desired the female's room more than her company, so it came as a genuine relief when the keeper made her a rude sign to take herself off. Round the side of the evening telegraph, he just caught a fleeting glimpse of her face round the side of the door, with a kind of demented glassy grin, showing that she was not exactly all there, viewing with evident amusement the group of gazers round Skipper Murphy's nautical chest, and then there was no more of her. "'The gunboat,' the keeper said. "'It beats me,' Mr. Bloom confided to Stephen. "'Medically, I am speaking, how a wretched creature like that from the Lock Hospital, reeking with disease, can be barefaced enough to solicit, or how any man in his sober senses, if he values his health in the least.' unfortunate creature. Of course I suppose some man is ultimately responsible for her condition. Still, no matter what the cause is from. Stephen had not noticed her, and shrugged his shoulders, merely remarking, In this country people sell much more than she ever had, and do a roaring trade. Fear not them that sell the body, but have not power to buy the soul. She is a bad merchant." She buys dear and sells cheap. The elder man, though not by any manner of means an old maid or, or a prude, said it was nothing short of a crying scandal that ought to be put to stop to instanter, to say that women of that stamp, quite apart from any old maidish squeamishness on the subject, a necessary evil, were not licensed and medically inspected by the proper authorities, a thing he could truthfully state, as a pater familias, was a stalwart advocate of from the very first start. Whoever embarked on a policy of the sort, he said, and ventilated the matter thoroughly, would confer a lasting boon on everybody concerned. You, as a good Catholic, he observed, talking of body and soul, believe in the soul. Or do you mean the intelligence, the brain power as such, as distinct from any outside object, the table, let us say, that cup? I believe in that myself, because it has been explained by competent men as the convolutions of the grey matter. Otherwise we would never have such inventions as X-rays, for instance. Do you? Thus cornered, Stephen had to make a superhuman effort of memory to try and concentrate and remember, before he could say, They tell me on the best authority it is a simple substance and therefore incorruptible. It would be immortal, I understand, but for the possibility of its annihilation by its first cause, 
who, from all I can hear, is quite capable of adding that to the number of his other practical jokes. Corruptio per se, and corruptio per accidents, both being excluded by court etiquette. Mr. Bloom thoroughly acquiesced in the general gist of this, though the mystical finesse involved was a bit out of his sublunary depth. Still he felt bound to enter a demurrer on the head of simple, promptly rejoining, Simple? I shouldn't think that is the proper word. Of course I grant you to concede a point. You do knock across a simple soul once in a blue moon. But what I am anxious to arrive at is it is one thing, for instance, to invent those rays Röntgen did, or the telescope like Edison, though I believe it was before his time Galileo was the man, I mean, and the same applies to the laws, for example, of a far-reaching natural phenomenon such as electricity, but it's a horse of quite another colour to say you believe in the existence of a supernatural god. Oh, that! Stephen expostulated, has been proved conclusively by several of the best-known passages in Holy Writ, apart from circumstantial evidence. On this knotty point, however, the views of the pair, poles apart as they were, both in schooling and everything else, with a marked difference in their respective ages, clashed. Has been? The more experienced of the two objected, sticking to his original point with a smile of unbelief. I'm not so sure about that. That's a matter for every man's opinion, and without dragging in the sectarian side of the business, I beg to differ with you in toto there. My belief is, to tell you the candid truth, that those bits were genuine forgeries, all of them put in by monks, most probably, or it's the big question of our national poet over again who precisely wrote them like Hamlet and Bacon, as you who know your Shakespeare infinitely better than I, of course I needn't tell you. Can't you drink that coffee, by the way? Let me stir it. And take a piece of that bun. It's one of our skipper's bricks disguised. Still, no one can give what he hasn't got. Try a bit. Couldn't. Stephen contrived to get out his mental organs for the moment, refusing to dictate further. Fault-finding being a proverbially bad hat, Mr. Bloom thought well to stir or try to the glotted sugar from the bottom, and reflected with something approaching acrimony on the coffee palace and its temperance and lucrative work. To be sure, it was a legitimate object, and beyond yea or nay did a world of good, shelters such as the present one they were in, run on teetotal lines for vagrants at night. Concerts, dramatic evenings and useful lectures, admittance free, by qualified men for the lower orders. On the other hand, he had a distinct and painful recollection they paid his wife, Madame Marion Tweedy, who had been prominently associated with, at one time, a very modest remuneration indeed for her piano-playing. The idea, he was strongly inclined to believe, was to do good and net a profit, there being no competition to speak of. Sulphate of copper, poison, SO4 or something, in some dried peas he remembered reading of in a cheap eating-house somewhere, but he couldn't remember when it was or where. Anyhow, inspection, medical inspection, of all eatables seemed to him more than ever necessary, which possibly accounted for the vogue of Dr. Tibble's vi cocoa on account of the medical analysis involved. Have a shot at it now, he ventured to say of the coffee after being stirred. Thus prevailed on to at any rate taste it, Stephen lifted the heavy mug from the brown puddle it clopped out of when taken up by the handle and took a sip of the offending beverage. Still it's solid food, his good genius urged. I'm a stickler for solid food, his one and only reason being not gormandizing in the least, but regular meals as the sine qua non for any kind of proper work, mental or manual. You ought to eat more solid food. You would feel a different man. Liquids I can eat, Stephen said. But, oh, 
Oblige me by taking away that knife. I can't look at the point of it. It reminds me of Roman history. Mr. Bloom promptly did as suggested and removed the incriminated article, a blunt, horn-handled ordinary knife, with nothing particularly Roman or antique about it to the lay eye, observing that the point was the least conspicuous point about it. Our mutual friend's stories are like himself, Mr. Bloom, apropos of knives, remarked to his confidant, Sotto voce. Do you think they are genuine? He could spin those yarns for hours on end, all night long, and lie like old boots. Look at him. Yet still, though his eyes were thick with sleep and sea air, life was full of a host of things and coincidences of a terrible nature, and it was quite within the bounds of possibility that it was not an entire fabrication, though at first blush there was not much inherent probability in all the spoof he got off his chest being strictly accurate gospel. He had been, meantime, taking stock of the individual in front of him, and Sherlock Holmesing him up, ever since he clapped eyes on him. Though a well-preserved man of no little stamina, if a trifle prone to baldness, there was something spurious in the cut of his jib that suggested a jail delivery, and it required no violent stretch of imagination to associate such a weird-looking specimen with the oakum and treadmill fraternity. He might even have done for his man supposing it was his own case, he told, as people often did about others, namely that he killed him himself and had served his four and or five good-looking years in durance vile, to say nothing of the Antonio personage, no relation to the dramatic personage of identical name who sprang from the pen of our national poet, who expiated his crimes in the melodramatic manner above described. On the other hand, he might be only bluffing, a pardonable weakness, because meeting unmistakable mugs, Dublin residents, like those Jarvis waiting news from abroad, would tempt any ancient mariner who sailed the ocean seas to draw the long boat about the schooner Hesperus, and etc. And when all was said and done, the lies a fellow told about himself couldn't possibly hold a proverbial candle to the wholesale whoppers other fellows coined about him. Mind you, I'm not saying that it's all pure invention, he resumed. Analogous scenes are occasionally, if not often, met with. Giants, though that is rather a far cry, you see once in a way. Marcella, the midget queen. In those waxworks in Henry Street, I myself saw some Aztecs, as they are called, sitting bow-legged. They couldn't straighten their legs if you paid them, because the muscles here, you see, he proceeded, indicating on his companion the brief outline of the sinews, or whatever you like to call them, behind the right knee, were utterly powerless from sitting that way so long cramped up, being adored as gods. There's an example again of simple souls. However, reverting to friend Sinbad and his horrifying adventures, who reminded him a bit of Ludwig, alias Ludwig, when he occupied the boards of the gaiety when Michael Gunn was identified with the management in The Flying Dutchman. A stupendous success, and his host of admirers came in large numbers, everyone simply flocking to hear him, though ships of any sort, phantom or the reverse, on the stage usually fell a bit flat, as also did trains. There was nothing intrinsically incompatible about it, he conceded. On the contrary, that stab in the back touch was quite in keeping with those Italianos though, candidly, he was none the less free to admit those ice-creamers and friars in the fishway, not to mention the chip-potato variety and so forth over in Little Italy, there near the Coombe, where sober, thrifty, hard-working fellows, except perhaps a bit too given to pot-hunting, the harmless necessary animal of the feline persuasion, or others at night, so as to have a good old succulent tuck-in with garlic de rigueur of him or her, next day on the quiet, and, he added, on the cheap. Spaniards, for instance, he continued, passionate temperaments like that, impetuous as old Nick, 
are given to taking the law in their own hands and give you your quietest double quick with those poignards they carry in the abdomen. It comes from the great heat, climate generally. My wife is, so to speak, Spanish, half that is. Point of fact, she could actually claim Spanish nationality if she wanted, having been born in, technically, Spain, that is Gibraltar. She has the Spanish type. Quite dark, regular brunette black. I, for one, certainly believe climate accounts for character. That's why I asked you if you wrote your poetry in Italian. The temperaments at the door, Stephen interposed with, were very passionate about ten shillings. Roberto ruba ruba sua. Quite so, Mr. Bloom dittoed. Then, Stephen said, staring and rambling on to himself or some unknown listener somewhere, we have the impetuosity of Dante and the isosceles triangle Miss Portinari he fell in love with and Leonardo and San Tommaso Mastino. It's in the blood. Mr. Bloom acceded at once. All are washed in the blood of the sun. Coincidence I just happened to be in the Kildari Street Museum today. "'shortly prior to our meeting, if I can so call it, "'and I was just looking at those antique statues there. "'The splendid proportions of hips, bosom, "'you simply don't knock against those kind of women here. "'An exception here and there, handsome, yes, pretty in a way you find, "'but what I'm talking about is the female form. "'Besides, they have so little taste in dress, most of them, "'which greatly enhances a woman's natural beauty.' no matter what you say. Rumpled stockings, it may be, possibly is, a foible of mine, but still it's a thing I simply hate to see. Interest, however, was starting to flag out somewhat all round, and then the others got on to talking about accidents at sea, ships lost in a fog, goo collisions with icebergs, all that kind of thing. Ship Ahoy, of course, had its own say to say. He had doubled the cape a few odd times and weathered a monsoon, a kind of wind, in the China seas, and through all those perils of the deep there was one thing, he declared, stood to him, or words to that effect, a pious medal he had that saved him. So then, after that, they drifted on to the wreck off Daunt's Rock, wreck of that ill-fated Norwegian bark. Nobody could think of her name for the moment, till the Javi, who had really quite a look of Henry Campbell, remembered it palm on Booter's town strand. That was the talk of the town that year. Albert William Quill wrote a fine piece of original verse of distinctive merit on the topic for Irish times. Breakers running over her, and crowds and crowds on the shore, in commotion, petrified with horror. Then someone said something about the case of the SS Lady Cairns of Swansea, run into by the Mona, which was on an opposite tack, in rather muggyish weather, and lost with all hands on deck. No aid was given. Her master, the Mona's, said he was afraid his collision bulkhead would give way. She had no water, it appears, in her hold. At this stage an incident happened. It having become necessary for him to unfurl a reef, the sailor vacated his seat. "'Let me cross your bows, mate,' he said to his neighbour, who was just gently dropping off into a peaceful doze. He made tracks heavily, slowly, with a dump sort of a gait to the door, stepped heavily down the one step there was out of the shelter, and bore due left. While he was in the act of getting his bearings, Mr. Bloom, who noticed when he stood up that he had two flasks of presumably ship's rum, sticking out of each pocket for the private consumption of his burning interior, saw him produce a bottle and uncork it, or unscrew, and, applying its nozzle to his lips, take a good old delectable swig out of it, with a gurgling noise. The irrepressible Bloom, who also had a shrewd suspicion that the old stager went out on a manoeuvre after the counter-attraction of the shape of a female, or, however, had disappeared to all intents and purposes, could by straining just perceive him, 
when duly refreshed by his rum puncheon exploit, gaping up at the piers and girders of the loop line, rather out of his, his depth, as of course it was already radically altered since his last visit and greatly improved. Some person or persons invisible directed him to the male urinal erected by the cleansing committee all over the place for the purpose, but after a brief space of time during which silence reigned supreme, the sailor, evidently giving it a wide berth, eased himself closer at hand, the noise of his bilge water some little time subsequently splashing on the ground, where it apparently awoke a horse on the cab rank, a hoof scooped anyway for the new foothold, after sleep and harness jingled. Slightly disturbed in his sentry-box by the brazier of live coke, the watcher of the corporation stones, who, though now broken down and fast breaking up, was none other in stern reality than the gumley aforesaid, now practically on the parish rates, given the temporary job by Pat Tobin, in all human probability from dictates of humanity, knowing him before shifted about, and shuffled in his box before composing his limbs again on to the arms of Morpheus, a truly amazing piece of hard lines in its most virulent form on a fellow most respectably connected and familiarized with decent home comforts all his life, who came in for a cool one hundred pounds a year at one time, which of course the double-barrelled ass proceeded to make general ducks and drakes of. And there he was at the end of his tether, after having often painted the town tolerably pink without a beggarly stiver. He drank needless, to be told, and it pointed only once more, a moral when he might quite easily be in a large way of business if, a big if, however, he had contrived to cure himself of his particular partiality. All meantime were loudly lamenting the falling off in Irish shipping, coastwise and foreign as well, which was all part and parcel of the same thing. A Palgrave Murphy boat was put off the ways at Alexandra Basin, the only launch that year. Right enough the harbours were there, only no ships ever called. There were wrecks and wreckers, the keeper said, who was evidently au fait. What he wanted to ascertain was why the ship ran bang against the only rock in Galway Bay, when the Galway Harbour scheme was mooted by a Mr. Worthington or some name like that, eh? Ask the then captain, he advised them, how much palmoil the British government gave him for that day's work, Captain John Lever of the Lever Line. Am I right, skipper? he queried of the sailor now returning after his private potation and the rest of his exertions. That worthy, picking up the scent of the fag-end of the song, or words growled in would-be music, but with great vim some kind of chanty or other in seconds or thirds. Mr. Bloom's sharp ears heard him then expectorate, the plug, probably, which it was, so that he must have lodged it, lodged it for the time being in his f in his fist, while he did the drinking and making water jobs, and found it a bit sour after the liquid fire in question. Anyhow, he rolled it after his successful libation computation, introducing an atmosphere of drink into the soiree, boisterously trolling like a veritable son of a seacock. The biscuits was as hard as brass, and the beef as salt as Lot's wife's arse. Oh, Johnny Lever, Johnny Lever, oh! After which effusion, the redoubtable specimen duly arrived on the scene, and regaining his seat, he sank rather than sat heavily on the form provided. Skin the goat, assuming he was he, evidently with an axe to grind, was airing his grievances, in a forcibly feeble philippic anent the natural resources of Ireland, or something of that sort, which he described in his lengthy dissertation as the richest country bar none on the face of God's earth, far and away superior to England, with coal in large quantities, six million pounds worth of pork exported every year, 
ten millions between butter and eggs, and all the riches drained out of it by England, levying taxes on the poor people that paid through the nose always, and gobbling up the best meat in the market, and, lo and a lot more surplus steam in the same vein. Their conversation accordingly became general, and all agreed that that was a fact. You could grow any mortal thing in Irish soil, he stated, and there was that Colonel Ever Everard down there in Navan growing tobacco. Where would you find anywhere the like of Irish bacon? But a day of reckoning, he stated crescendo with no uncertain voice, thoroughly monopolizing all the conversation, was in store for mighty England, despite her power of pelf on account of her crimes. There would be a fall and the greatest fall in history. The Germans and the Japs were going to have their little look-in, he affirmed. The Boers were the beginning of the end. Brummagem, England, was toppling already, and her downfall would be Ireland, her Achilles' heel, which he explained to them about the vulnerable point of Achilles, the Greek hero, a point his auditors at once seized as he completely gripped their attention by showing the tendon referred to on his boot. His advice to every Irishman was, stay in the land of your birth, and work for Ireland, and live for Ireland. Ireland, Parnell said, could not spare a single one of her sons. Silence all round marked the termination of this finale. The impervious navigator heard these lurid tidings undismayed. Take a bit of doing, boss, retaliated that rough diamond palpably a bit peeved in response to the foregoing truism. In which cold douche, referring to the downfall and so on, the keeper concurred, but nevertheless held to his main view. "'Who's the best troops in the army?' the grizzled old veteran irately interrogated. "'And the best jumpers and racers, and the best admirals and generals we've got. Tell me that.' "'The Irish for choice,' retorted the cabby like Campbell, facial blemishes apart. "'That's right,' the old tarpaulin corroborated. "'The Irish Catholic peasant, he's the backbone of our empire. "'You know Jem Mullins?' "'While allowing him his individual opinions, "'as every man the keeper added, "'he cared nothing for any empire, ours or his, "'and considered no Irishman worthy of his salt that served it. Then they began to have a few irascible words when it waxed hotter, both, needless to say, appealing to the listeners who followed the passage of arms with interest, so long as they didn't indulge in recriminations and come to blows. From inside information extending over a series of years, Mr. Bloom was rather inclined to pooh-pooh the suggestion as egregious balderdash for, pending that consummation devoutly might to be or not to be wished for, he was fully cognizant of the fact that their neighbours across the channel, unless they were much bigger fools than he took them for, rather concealed their strength than the opposite. It was on a par with the Quixotic idea, in certain quarters, that in a hundred million years the cold seam of the sister island would be played out, and if, as time went on, they turned out to be how the cat jumped all he could personally say on the matter was that, as a host of contingencies, equally relevant to the issue, might occur ere then he was highly advisable in the interim to try to make the most of both countries, even though poles apart. Another little interesting point, the armours of whores and chummies, to put in common parlance, reminded him Irish soldiers had as often fought for England as against her, more so in fact. And now why? So the scene between the pair of them, the licensee of the place rumoured to be or have been Fitzharris, the famous Invincible, and the other, obviously bogus, reminded him forcibly as being on all fours with the confidence trick, supposing, that is, it was pre-arranged 
as the looker-on, a student of the human soul, if anything, the others seeing least of the game. And as for the lessee or keeper, who probably wasn't the other person at all, he, B, couldn't help feeling that most properly it was better to give people like that the goby, unless you were a blithering idiot altogether, and refused to have anything to do with them as a golden rule in private life, and their felon setting, there always being the off chance of a Danny man coming forward and turning Queen's evidence or King's now like Dennis or Peter Carey, an idea he utterly repudiated. Quite apart from that, he disliked those careers of wrongdoing and crime on principle. Yet, though such criminal propensities had never been an inmate of his bosom in any shape or form, he certainly did feel it no denying it, while inwardly remaining what he was, a certain kind of admiration for a man who had actually brandished a knife, cold steel, with the courage of his political convictions, though personally he would never be a party to such a thing. Off the same bat as those love vendettas of the South have her swing for her. When the husband frequently, after some words passed between the two concerning her relations with the other lucky mortal, he having had the pair watched, inflicted fatal injuries on his adored one as a result of an alternative post-nuptial liaison by plunging his knife into her until it just struck him that Fitz, nicknamed Skin the Goat, merely drove the car for the actual perpetrators of the outrage, and so was not, if he was reliably informed, actually party to the ambush, which, in point of fact, was the plea some legal luminary saved his skin on. In any case, that was very ancient history by now, and as for our friend, the pseudo skin the etc., he had transparently outlived his welcome. He ought to have either died naturally or on the scaffold high. Like actresses, always farewell positively, last performance, then come up smiling again. Generous to a fault, of course, temperamental, no economising on any idea of the sort, always snapping at the bone for the shadow. So similarly he had a very shrewd suspicion that Mr. Johnny Lever got rid of some LSD in the course of his perambulations round the docks in the congenial atmosphere of the old island tavern, come back to Erin and so on. Then, as for the other, he had heard not so long before the same identical lingo as he told Stephen how he simply but effectually silenced the offender. He took umbrage at something or other, that much injured, but on the whole even-tempered person declared, I let slip. He called me a Jew, and in a heated fashion offensively. So I, without deviating from plain facts in the least, told him his God, I mean Christ, was a Jew too, and all his family like me, though in reality I'm not. That was one for him. A soft answer turns away wrath. He hadn't a word to say for himself, as everyone saw. Am I not right? He turned a long you-are-wrong gaze on Stephen of timorous dark pride, at the soft impeachment with a glance also of entreaty, for he seemed to glean in a kind of way that it wasn't all exactly. At Quibus, Stephen murmured, mumbled in a non-committal accent, their two or four eyes conversing. Christus, or Bloom, his name is, or, after all, any other, Secundum Carnum. Of course, Mr. B. proceeded to stipulate, you must look at both sides of the question. It is hard to lay down any hard and fast rules as to right and wrong, but room for improvement all round. There certainly is, though every country, they say, distressful included, has the government it deserves. But with a little good will all round. It's all very fine to boast of mutual superior superiority, but what about mutual equality? I resent violence and intolerance in any shape or form. It never reaches anything or stops anything. A revolution must come on the due instalments plan. It's a patent absurdity on the face of it 
to hate people because they live round the corner and speak another vernacular, in the next house, so to speak. Memorable bloody bridge battle and seven minutes war, Stephen assented, between Skinner's Alley and Ormond Market. Yes, Mr. Bloom thoroughly agreed, entirely endorsing the remark. That was overwhelmingly right. And the whole world was full of that sort of thing. You just took the words out of my mouth, he said. A hocus-pocus of conflicting evidence that candidly you couldn't remotely. All those wretched quarrels, in his humble opinion, stirring up bad blood, from some bump of combativeness or gland of some kind, erroneously supposed to be about a punctilio of honour and a flag, were very largely a question of the money question, which was at the back of everything greed and jealousy, people never knowing when to stop. They accuse, remarked he audibly. He turned away from the others, who probably, and spoke nearer to, so as the others in case they. Jews, he softly imparted in an aside in Stephen's ear, are accused of ruining. Not a vestige of truth in it, I can safely say. History, would you be surprised to learn, proves up to the hilt. Spain decayed when the Inquisition hounded the Jews out, and England prospered when Cromwell, an uncommonly able ruffian who in other respects has much to answer for, imported them. Why? Because they are imbued with the proper spirit. They are practical and are proved to be so. I don't want to indulge in any because, you know, the standard works on the subject and then orthodox as you are. But in the economic, not touching religion domain, the priests spell poverty. Spain again, you saw in the war, compared with Goathead America. Turks, it's in the dogma. Because if they didn't believe they'd go straight to heaven when they die, they'd try to live better. At least so I think. That's the juggle on which the P.P.'s raise the wind on false pretenses. I'm, he resumed with dramatic force, as good an Irishman as that rude person I told you about at the outset, and I want to see everyone, in concluded he, all creeds and classes pro rata, having a comfortably tidy-sized income, in no niggard fashion either, something in the neighbourhood of three hundred pounds per annum. That's the vital issue at stake, and it's feasible and would be provocative of friendlier intercourse between man and man. At least that's my idea for what it's worth. I call that patriotism. Ubi patria, as we learned a smattering of in our classical days, in alma mater, vita bene, where you can live well, the sense is, if you work. Over his untastable apology for a cup of coffee, Listening to this synopsis of things in general, Stephen stared at nothing in particular. He could hear, of course, all kinds of words changing colour like those crabs about Ringsend in the morning, burrowing quickly into all colours of different sorts, of the same sand where they had a home somewhere beneath or seemed to. When he looked up and saw the eyes that said or didn't say the words, the voice he heard said, If you work. Count me out, he managed to remark, meaning work. The eyes were surprised at this observation, because, as he, the person who owned them pro tem, observed, or rather his voice speaking did, all must work, have to, together. I mean, of course, the other hastened to affirm, work in the widest possible sense. Also literary labour, not merely for the kudos of the thing, Writing for the newspapers, which is the readiest channel nowadays, that's work too, important work. After all, from the little I know of you, after all the money expended on your ex education, you are entitled to recoup yourself and command your price. You have every bit as much right to live by your pen in pursuit of your philosophy as the peasant has. What? You belong to Ireland, the brain and the brawn. Each is equally important. You suspect, Stephen retorted with a sort of a half-laugh, that I may be important because I belong to the Faubourg Saint Patrice, called Ireland for short. I would go a step farther, 
Mr. Bloom insinuated. "'But I suspect,' Stephen interrupted, "'that Ireland must be important because it belongs to me.' "'What belongs?' queried Mr. Bloom, bending, fancying he was perhaps under some misapprehension. "'Excuse me. Unfortunately I didn't catch the latter portion. What was it you—' Stephen, patently cross-tempered, repeated and shoved aside his mug of coffee, or whatever you like to call it, none too politely, adding, "'We can't change the country. Let us change the subject.' At this pertinent suggestion, Mr. Bloom, to change the subject, looked down, but in a quandary, as he couldn't tell exactly what construction to put on, belongs to which sounded rather a far cry. The rebuke of some kind was clearer than the other part. Needless to say, the fumes of his recent orgy spoke then with some asperity, in a curious bitter way foreign to his sober state. Probably the home life to which Mr. B. attached the utmost importance had not been all that was needful, or he hadn't been familiarized with the right sort of people. With a touch of fear for the young man beside him, whom he furtively scrutinized with an air of some consternation, remembering he had just come back from Paris, the eyes more especially reminding him forcibly of father and sister, failing to throw much light on the subject, however, he brought to mind instances of cultured fellows that promised so brilliantly, nipped at the dub, of premature decay and nobody to blame for but themselves. For instance, there was the case of a Callaghan, for one, the half-crazy faddist, respectably connected, though of inadequate means, with his mad vagaries, among whose other gay doings when rotto, and making himself a nuisance to everybody all round, he was in the habit of ostentatiously sporting in public a suit of brown paper, a fact. And then the usual denouement, after the fun had gone on fast and furious, he got landed into hot water, and had to be spirited away by a few friends, after a strong hint to a blind horse from John Mallon of Lower Castle Yard, so as not to be made amenable under Section 2 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act, certain names of those subpoenaed being handed in, but not divulged for reasons which will occur to every anyone with a pick of brains. Briefly, putting two and two together, six, sixteen, which he pointedly turned a deaf ear to, Antonio and so forth, jockeys and aesthetes, and the tattoo which was all the go in the seventies or thereabouts, even in the House of Lords, because early in life the occupant of the throne, then heir apparent, the other members of the upper ten and other high personages, simply following in the footsteps of the head of the state, he reflected about the errors of notorieties and crowned heads running counter to morality, such as the Cromwell case a number of years before, under their veneer in a way scarcely intended by nature, a thing good Mrs. Grundy, as the law stands, was terribly down on, though not for the reasons they thought they were probably. Whatever it was, except women, chiefly, who were always fiddling, more or less, at one another, it being largely a matter of dress and all the rest of it. Ladies who like distinctive underclothing should, and every well-tailored man must, trying to make the gap wider between them by innuendo, and give more of a genuine fillip to acts of impropriety between the two. She unbuttoned his, and then he untied her. Mind the pin— whereas savages in the cannibal islands, say, ninety degrees in the shade, not caring a continental. However, reverting to the original, there were, on the other hand, others who had forced their way to the top, from the lowest rung by the aid of their bootstraps. Sheer force of natural genius, that, with brains, sir. For which and further reasons he felt it was his interest and duty, even, to wait on and profit by the unlooked-for occasion, though why he could not exactly tell, being, as it was, already several shillings to the bad, having in fact let himself in for it. Still, to cultivate the acquaintance of someone of no uncommon calibre, who could provide food for reflection, would amply repay any small. 
Intellectual stimulation as such was, he felt from time to time, a first-rate tonic for the mind. Added to which was the coincidence of meeting, discussion, dance, row, old sort of the here-today-and-gone-tomorrow type, night loafers, the whole galaxy of events, all went to make up a miniature cameo of the world we live in, especially as the lives of the submerged tents, viz. coal miners, divers, scavengers, etc., were very much under the microscope lately. To improve the shining hour, he wondered whether he might meet with anything approaching the same luck of Mr. Billip Beaufoy, if taken down in writing, suppose he were to pen something out of the common groove, as he fully intended doing, at the rate of one guinea per column. My experiences, let us say, in a cabman's shelter. The pink edition extra, sporting of the telegraphic lie, lay, as luck would have it, beside his elbow, and he was just puzzling again, far from satisfied, over a country belonging to him, and the preceding rebus, the vessel came from Bridgewater, and the postcard was addressed, A. Boudin, to find the captain's age. His eyes went aimlessly over the respective captains, which came under his special province, the all-embracing give us this day our daily press. First he got a bit of a start, but then it turned out to be only somebody, something about somebody named H. Du Bois, agent for typewriters or something like that. Great Battle, Tokyo. Love-making in Irish. Two hundred pounds damages. Gordon Bennett. Emigration Swindle. Letter from His Grace. William. Ascot Meeting. The Gold Cup. Victory of Outsider Throwaway. Recalls Derby of 92, when Captain Marshall's dark horse, Sir Hugo, captured the Blue Ribboned at long odds. New York Disaster. Thousand Lives Lost. Foot and Mouth. Funeral of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. So, to change the subject, he read about Dignam R.I.P., which, he reflected, was anything but a gay send-off, or a change of address, anyway. End of section 16, part 2 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June 2006